Good afternoon, folks. I'd like to call to order the Stripe Bass Board. I'm Mike Armstrong, your chair. Um, so you all have an agenda. Any improvements, additions? Yes, Tony. If it so pleases the chairman, I'd like to give a, an update on the um, Stripe Bass tagging, cooperative tagging program. Yes, that pleases me. Okay. Uh, yeah. So any disapprovals of the agenda with the added item? Seeing none, it is approved. Uh, you all have the minutes from October 2018th. Any revisions? Any objection to accepting it as written? Seeing none, uh, the proceedings are approved. At this point, we, have, we will accept brief public comments um, on items that are not part of um, the meeting today. And so that would include the assessment. Uh, we aren't accepting comments on that. Seeing no comments, we'll move on. Uh, the first item is the review the preliminary ASMFC stock assessment summary. And as you know, the, the official approval has not been issued by NIMPS from the SARC yet, and so this is called a uh, preliminary review. Um, so Mike, lead us through. Uh, thank, thank you. <clears throat> um, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so I was going to start my presentation off with exactly that remark. These results are considered preliminary. Uh, I also want to sort of uh, preface the remarks by noting that we brought a number of models to uh, the assessment review in uh, November. <coughs> uh, the committee put a ton of work into a migration model, uh, and Gary Nelson in particular. Um, uh, we anticipate the review um, not accepting that uh, model for management, so we are bringing forward uh, the model that we had uh, reviewed in uh, 2013. So um, with that, I'll begin the presentation. And uh, I'd like to start this presentation the same way we started our presentations in um, Woods Hole in November with a huge thank you uh, to all of our committees that worked on striped bass, uh, the technical committee, the uh, stock assessment subcommittee, tagging committees. Uh, it, it really takes a village um, uh, to move through a benchmark assessment, and everyone did an amazing job. I'll start with uh, some of the bridge building that we did to get us uh, to, the, to this new model. Um, we started, uh, thank you. Uh, we, we started with, uh, the, I mentioned earlier, we started with the 2013 uh, stock assessment review model and data configuration. We updated that with data through 2016, uh, including the old uncalibrated MRIP estimates. Um, we then uh, took that same model uh, completely unaltered and just plugged in the new uh, calibrated MRIP estimates. Uh, then we created a base model uh, with some of the changes that are described on the, the slide. So uh, in particular, again, we uh, are now using calibrated MRIP data, and we have some slides um, uh, that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. We extended the plus group from 13 to 15. Uh, we reduced the number of fleets uh, from 3 to 2. The uh, previous implementation of this model had a commercial discard fleet that was um, presented some logistic uh, constraints to management, and uh, so the assessment committee over the last number of years, and I think Gary Nelson in particular, uh, was able to uh, partition those commercial dead discards into uh, Chesapeake Bay and uh, coastal fleets. Um, uh, we also made a number of changes to some of our indices. Uh, for example, we dropped two indices. We dropped uh, the Virginia pound net index. The committee had concerns related to the single fixed station design of that survey. Uh, we dropped the um, uh, Northeast Fisheries Science Center's trawl survey. Uh, the committee had concerns related to uh, low proportion of uh, positive toes, as well as um, the elimination of inshore strata that were no longer sampled uh, with the vessel change in about 2008 or so. Um, we added uh, an, an index. We added a Delaware, uh, Delaware uh, Bay 30-foot trawl survey uh, that was designed to give us some additional information on Delaware Bay striped bass. We added a CHESMAP trawl survey uh, that was designed to replace some of the information that we were losing from the Virginia Pound Net Index. Uh, we also took two indices that were 
previously modeled as just, uh, we were just fitting to the trend in the data, um, the MRIP index and the Connecticut trawl. But as part of this assessment, we were able to uh, develop age composition information for those indices as well. So now the model is able to fit to uh, not just the trend, but uh, age proportions as well. And we also uh, made it in a change to our Young of the Year survey. So we have um, a Young of the Year survey from Maryland and Virginia, and those surveys are, are ongoing. Uh, of course, one of the one of the things we've heard from review panels over the years is they would like to have, they'd like to see a single index for that represents the Chesapeake Bay as a whole. So uh, over as part of this assessment, we uh, were able to. Um, develop a composite index using uh, some modeling techniques that, that, that have been used in other species. Um, and so we now have a, a single uh, bay-wide uh, Young of the Year index. We also updated uh, female maturity ogive. Uh, that work was done uh, by um, Angela Giuliano and her colleagues at uh, Maryland um, DNR. Uh, scale and otolith ages are used, and uh, the terminal year for the, the base model is 2017. Um, so first, I'll start talking about just some of the general uh, catch information. So the plot, the plot that's um, on the screen uh, shows number of fish uh, removal by source. So uh, the dark blue bars at the bottom are uh, commercial harvest. The white and white with sort of blue hash marks are commercial dead discards. Uh, the gray bars are uh, recreational harvest, and the gold bars are uh, recreational um, dead releases. So uh, the commercial harvest peaked in 1999 at about 1.2 million fish. Uh, you can see from 2004 through uh, approximately 2014, landings averaged about 950,000 fish uh, and have been generally trending downwards, averaging about 600,000 fish uh, from 2015 to 2017. And you may recall that in, uh, in, in that time frame, we also in implemented quota reductions as part of Addendum 4. Um, commercial dead discards. Um, uh, the releases were very low in the 80s, increased through the 90s, peaking in 1998 at about 350,000 fish, uh, and declined through 2010 or so, and have been relatively stable since. Uh, recreational harvest numbers, and these are the, the gray bars, um, recreational harvest increased, um, it increased from uh, very low estimates in the 1980s, increased through the 90s, and uh, peaked in 2010 at 5.4 million fish. And harvest has since declined to about uh, 3 million fish in 27, uh, 2017. Uh, and then finally, um, recreational release losses uh, peaked at 2006 uh, in, at about five, uh, 5 million fish, declined through 2011, and have been generally increasing since then. Uh, and then the table that's on this plot just shows a uh, source of mortality uh, just in the terminal year 2017. And you can see. Um, uh, most of our most of our removals are from uh, recreational dead releases in 2017. At just under uh, 50 percent, recreational harvest uh, is responsible for 42 percent of the removals. Uh, commercial dead releases at 2 percent, and commercial harvest is responsible for 8 percent of our total removals. Uh, the next plot is just total removals by fleet, just to illustrate uh, removals by our. Uh, uh, coastal fleet and the uh, Chesapeake Bay fleet, and you can see the blue bars at the bottom are Chesapeake, the orange bars above are the coastal fleet, and the Chesapeake is responsible for about 40% of the total removals. So I'll go through and describe a bit about uh, trends in recreational harvest and catch um, as, part of the, uh, as part of this assessment, and this would bring me, I guess, to a discussion on uh, the MRIP calibration process. Um, so we were one of the first assessments to go through uh, the peer review process uh, with the new uh, calibrated MRIP estimates. Uh, the 2006 uh, NRC review confirmed what many of you uh, were are generally aware of, that the effort survey was becoming less effective over time. Um, so subsequent work resulted in adoption and implementation of a male-based fishing effort survey, um, and that was implemented, implemented in 2018. Uh, so we were able to use those estimates as part of our, um, this, the current assessment. Also as part of that review, they, uh, that review identified some concerns related to the intercept portion of that survey, uh, and so that was uh, able, able to be resolved as well. And so the final estimates that we're using account for uh, changes to the uh, intercept portion of the survey as well as the fishing effort survey as well. The plot that's uh, on the screen now um, shows uh, the percent difference between the original uncalibrated estimates and the final calibrated estimates for harvest, which is the top plot, uh, and uh, live releases on the bottom. Um, 
the red line uh, going across the top bar is the, in, in both instances is the average across the time series. So harvest, uh, the percent difference between the uncalibrated estimates and the final calibrated estimates for harvest is about 140 percent. The percent change um, varied between roughly 50 percent and 400 percent. Some of those larger percent differences that we see occurred early in the time series. Um, there were catches where harvest was low early in the time series. So small changes on low harvest can result in very large uh, percent differences. Um, but the part of the plot that I'll draw your attention to in particular is the part between maybe 1995 or so uh, through just before 2010. You'll see the bars are just below the average. Uh, and then after about 2010 or so, you'll see uh, the percent difference, uh, the, the calibration accounts for a much greater difference uh, from the early, early uncalibrated estimates later in the time series. Uh, the calibration process um, honed in on cell phone usage over time, and so um, with increasing cell phone usage, uh, the calibrated estimates began to grow farther and farther apart from the uncalibrated estimates. The plot below that is for live releases and shows a general similar trend. Uh, the time series average percent difference between the uncalibrated estimates and the calibrated estimates is about 160 percent, but we see that same trend of um, uh, just be uh, slightly below average uh, adjustments prior to uh, 2000, 2005 or so, and then slightly uh, above average beyond that, again, related to primarily um, cell phone usage. So the next plot shows a uh, catch comparison uh, so that we can see um, just the impact that the calibration process had. So in this plot, harvest is uh, plotted on the left and live releases on the right. I'll point out that the scale of the two plots are different, so uh, keep, just please keep that in mind. Um, and you can see the, uh, the legend, the gray lines, which are sort of uh, really overlapping with the orange lines, are the uncalibrated estimates and the uh, APIS calibrated estimates. So this is the completely uncalibrated estimates um, and the intercept portion, uh, inter intercept portion uh, calibration. You can see the intercept portion had a very minor, very minor influence. But when calibrating uh, for the effort survey, uh, our understanding of harvest and live releases uh, really changed dramatically. So um, in terms of harvest on the left, the scale uh, is in millions of fish. Again, you can see there's a, uh, not a lot of difference between the uncalibrated estimates and the calibrated estimates early in the time series, but that really grows over time. And so for example, in our, our prior to when the calibrated estimates were released, our understanding of how many fish were harvested uh, uh, the peak harvest uh, prior to the calibration, we thought that there were about two and a half to maybe three million fish harvested. After calibration, um, that number is closer to five million. Um, the trends are similar with respect to um, the live releases, uh, but you can see the scale is quite a bit different. So we initially thought um, prior to the calibration, um, live releases peaked at about 20 million. After the calibration, we think they peaked at about 50 million based on the uh, calibrated MRIP, uh, MRIP estimates. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through all the states, but um, we did see these, these same patterns uh, held up over uh, among the states. Some states were more pronounced, changes were more pronounced in some states relative to others. Uh, but the series of plots that are on the screen now show recreational harvest by state. Uh, and they're oriented uh, from north to south. So Maine is in the top left, North Carolina is in the bottom right. Um, the, Scales on these plots change, are all different among the different states, uh, and again, show the general same trend. Um, not a lot of difference between calibrated and uncalibrated estimates early in the time series, and generally increases over time. Um, the next plot is uh, the same, but now for live releases. The arrangement of states are in the same order. We can revisit these if, if, uh, if, if people have questions, but in the interest of time, I'll just sort of uh, gloss over these. And then the final plot I have on um, related to, largely related to catch is catch composition. So uh, this is the catch at age uh, broken out by fleet. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay is on the left and the ocean fleet is on the right. Uh, the y-axis is year and it's scaled from earliest in the time series at the top through most recent at the bottom. And the x-axis is age, so uh, age one through age 15 plus. And the sort of take home message from these plots are, uh, you can see that early in the time series, uh, I'll, I'll, in both instances for the Chesapeake and for the coast, but it's, uh, there's a, the pattern is more dramatic in the Chesapeake. You can see we don't see a lot of old fish in the catch, large old fish in the catch in Chesapeake Bay. 
in the 1980s. So if you look at sort of the top right portion of that plot, uh, there are no blue circles, which are uh, our representation of catch. Uh, as we move uh, through time, though, we start to see more and more fish um, showing up in those older age classes as the age composition is, is expanding. Uh, but there is, an, uh, there is a suggestion in these data as well, though, that we are starting to see a, a contraction of, of, of the age proportions later in the time series as well. So I'll go quickly through some of our, um, through all of our surveys. Um, I mentioned earlier the different changes we, we, we've, uh, uh, we, we did for this assessment, so I won't go through this again. I won't go through those details again unless there are questions. Um, this plot just shows a sort of spatial uh, depiction of where our different surveys are, so um, I won't go through that and again unless there are questions. You can just sort of see we're covering uh, New York through, um, uh, through the Chesapeake. We have a variety of age one and uh, uh, age zero and age one surveys. Uh, the next plot is showing our age one plus surveys. Um, I'll just take a second to sort of walk through this a little bit. There's a um, uh, it's kind of a squiggly line that runs along the coast from Maine to Virginia. That's the MRIP, uh, the MRIP survey that uh, that we're using, uh, and then the stars are the uh, different surveys that that take place. Again, just to kind of give you a sense of spatially where these surveys are taking place. Uh, the next plot is our plot of Young of the Year uh, survey indices. Uh, partially in the interest of time, I won't go through all of these individually. Uh, they, they largely speak for themselves, but I'm happy to revisit these during the uh, question and answer portion. Um, but you can see uh, New York Young of the Year uh, in the top left, um, moving left to right, um, the Delaware Bay Young of the Year, Maryland Young of the Year, uh, then the next row, Virginia Young of the Year, and the composite. And again, uh, for this uh, for this um, assessment, we're, we're using the composite index. Uh, we're not using the individual uh, Maryland or Virginia on their own. We're using that, that, uh, co that the composite of those two surveys. Uh, the next plot is our age one indices. Uh, again, I, I probably won't talk a lot about these unless there are questions. Uh, there's evidence you can see from these plots that we do see evidence of, of uh, pulses of recruitment, strong recruitment years. Um, and we'll see those kind of reflected in the uh, model estimates of recruitment that we will spend some time talking about. Uh, and then finally, age comp uh, this, the next plot we have is uh, the age composition surveys. Uh, so I, I, again, I, I won't really spend any time talking about these. Um, uh, actually, maybe I will take a second. Uh, so MRIP, the, the MRIP index we, we have, uh, we've um, uh, made some minor changes to the way that that index is calculated. Uh, I mentioned earlier the Connecticut Long Island Sound Trawl Survey. We're not just fitting to the trend, now we're fitting to the age composition as well. And so you do start to see a suggestion of a decline in uh, the Connecticut trawl survey. Um, and we see a sort of, a, and also a contraction of age composition data. Uh, the New York Ocean Hall survey, uh, that survey's uh, been discontinued, but it provides great information on age composition, so we've retained it for that reason. Um, the New Jersey trawl survey kind of bounces around. Um, the Maryland spawning stock survey also kind of bounces around. Um, and so, uh, again, uh, we can go back and revisit these if there's questions, but I just kind of want to get them just sort of generally um, uh, on your radars. Uh, so I guess on to the statistical catch at age modeling. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're using the same model that we that was reviewed in 2013, that we did make uh, the sort of data improvements that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so this model uh, is estimating uh, recruitment, abundance in uh, of our, our youngest age classes, um, we are getting estimates of uh, fully recruited fishing mortality, uh, estimates of um, catchability for all of our age composition surveys. Um, we're fitting to uh, four different selectivity time blocks uh, to help us sort of get a better hand, uh, more accurately uh, model uh, selectivity with changes in regulations. And again, I mentioned that uh, the data are split into two fleets, and again, to give us a, a, a better handle on uh, estimating selectivity for differences in uh, fisheries between the bay and the, and the coast. So uh, on to the results. Uh, the first plot we have is fully recruited uh, fishing mortality uh, by fleet. Um, so just in general, you can see the gray line is uh, the Chesapeake Bay fishing mortality. The yellow or gold line is uh, fishing mortality along uh, the Atlantic coast. In general, you see that uh, fishing mortality in the Chesapeake is uh, lower than uh, in, in, the, uh, in the coast. Uh, there's a period of very low F in the late 80s. Um, there's a sort of a increase through the mid 1990s in, in, uh, in, in both fleets. And then uh, kind of some oscillation and perhaps stabilization um, of F uh, 
for the remainder of the time series. Uh, the next plot is fully recruited fishing mortality. This is for the, the stock as a whole. So uh, if you take the individual Fs at age for those previous two plots and add them together and take the maximum F at age, that's this plot. So our sort of understanding of coast-wide fully recruited fishing mortality. Uh, it really sort of recapitulates what we saw at the fleet level. There's a period of very low uh, fishing mortality in the late 1980s, uh, increases through about 1995, um, and then that fishing mortality kind of oscillates uh, roughly between 0.22 and about 0.3 or so. The next plot we have is of uh, recruitment. This is uh, recruitment is estimated in the model. Um, so the year class is actually one year earlier. Uh, but you can see from 1982 through um, the early 1990s is that there's a suggestion of a period of very low recruitment. Um, from 1994, representing the 1993 year class, through uh, 2004, uh, representing the 03 year class, there's a period of variable but relatively high recruitment. Um, after 2004, we see variable but relatively lower recruitment, though there are some stronger year classes, the 2011, uh, 2015 year classes. Um, are, are, are relatively strong. The uh, dotted horizontal orange line is the time series average of recruitment. Uh, the next plot we have is um, our trajectory of uh, female spawning stock biomass. Um, I'll show this plot again with our uh, threshold, which will provide some, some uh, I think, some, uh, some reference. But uh, you can see, again, it's, this is the result that we largely saw in the previous assessment. There's a period of very low uh, SSB early in the time series. Uh, we see a peak in about 1995 or 96, um, a decrease, a peak again in 03, and then uh, a decline uh, over the last 20 years or so in, in uh, spawning stock. Um, one of the things we do as Part of our assessments is sort of a, a suite of sensitivity runs, uh, and uh, one very important one for us is the retrospective analysis. This gives us uh, a sense of um, just how much parameters might change with the addition of um, an additional year of data. So this plot um, on the left-hand side, we have the actual sort of time series of um, age 8 plus abundance, uh, female spawning stock biomass, fully recruited fishing mortality, and recruitment. Um, each line represents a, a run of the, the model with one additional year of data removed. Uh, I'll focus more on the, for the plot on the right, which is uh, the percent difference between um, 2017 and a model run uh, with one year subtracted. Um, so, and I'll focus in particular with that subset on uh, female spawning stock biomass and fully recruited fishing mortality. So what we saw, and this was a bit of a, uh, a bit of a difference uh, from the 2013 uh, iteration of this model, we see very little retrospective patterning here. Um, in um, the 2013 model, our average retrospective uh, was about we saw a, about 12 to 15 percent difference between uh, the terminal year and um, some of these peeled uh, these earlier time estimates, uh, these earlier estimates. Uh, in this implementation, we see an average over four years of. Uh, almost zero percent, but the range is about plus or minus two percent. So, uh, and we see that uh, in spawning stock biomass and in fishing mortality. Similar to what we've seen uh, in previous iterations of this model, we generally tend to underestimate biomass so that with additional years of data, um, SSB increases, and the opposite is true for fishing mortality. Uh, one caveat uh, there is with the addition of one or two years of data, um, we actually expect with one year of additional data a slight decrease in SSB, and that's a, a bit of a variance from what we've seen in the past. Um, but it's a, a fraction of a percent decline that we would expect to see. Um, one more sensitivity run that I'll um, describe. I, I mentioned in my first or second slide the series of model runs we did as part of our bridge building and continuity runs. So we started with, again, the, the model that was peer-reviewed in 2013, updated that through with data through 2016. Um, and that represents the dotted green line um, on the slide. Um, and it looks like that's, that's showing up pretty reasonably. Uh, the next step we did was take that exact model, excuse me, unaltered, and plug in the new MRIP estimates, the new calibrated MRIP estimates that I described earlier. That is the red dotted line uh, that's on the plot. Uh, we did some additional uh, bridge building along the way, but um, the other line that we have on here is that black solid line. That's our, uh, that's our final base run uh, from, uh, from the model. 
And of course, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest things that might jump out at you is uh, if you look at the green dotted line, again, that's our uh, 2013 model just updated through, um, through the present. Uh, the rate of SSB decline is uh, fairly shallow. Um, it predicts a, a relatively shallow decline in SSB over time. Uh, what we see in the final base run is a very steep decline in, in SSB. And if you uh, think back to the MRIP catch estimates that we saw, uh, we think that a lot of that is, has to do with, uh, with the new estimates in, in MRIP. Um, and, and we see that same signal in our, in our surveys as well. We see it in a contraction of age composition data in, in most recent years. Um, I only have one slide on uh, our tag model work, um, which is a, a, just a compromise in terms of time. Uh, it's uh, a disservice to all the work that the tagging committee did, um, but uh, we only have so much time, unfortunately. But one of the things that we always like to do uh, with the tagging model is sort of use it as a, as a check against our statistical catch at age model estimate. So it's a great way for us to sort of have confidence that the modeling results that we're seeing out of the, the catch at age model are, are reasonable. Um, so this plot shows uh, total instantaneous mortality, so natural mortality plus fishing mortality for uh, the coastal programs, uh, the producer areas, and for the statistical catch at age. Um, the statistical catch at age is the, the black solid line. Uh, and aside from the early part of the time series where we don't have uh, analogous uh, tag model results, you can see that the trajectory and scale of all of our uh, total mortality estimates uh, are all in the same ballpark. Uh, they're, they're actually quite similar. Uh, so reference points. Um, the board and our terms of reference uh, tasked us to address reference points. Um, we wanted to develop a, uh, a range of um, reference points that uh, would address the objectives of the FMP. Uh, we explored both model-based and empirical estimates. Um, in, this in, in this model, uh, the, the non-migration model, uh, the model-based uh, estimates of um, reference points, um, and we looked at particular, in particular uh, spawning potential ratio reference points, uh, just weren't providing us realistic estimates, uh, particularly with respect to SSB. The F estimates were realistic, but the SSB estimates were not. Um, we weren't able to fully resolve, we have some hypotheses, but weren't able to fully resolve why that was. Uh, so we are only bringing forward, we only brought forward to the review empirical reference points, and we um, used empirical reference points uh, based on 1993 and 1995 estimates of uh, spawning stock biomass. Uh, this current model is not uh, stock specific. We're, we're modeling one stock, but we're doing that through uh, uh, sp spatial fleets. Um, so we're not able to develop um, stock specific reference points, but we can from this model uh, develop um, uh, f uh, region specific guidance. Um, in order for us to fully flesh that out, we would need some additional guidance from the board in terms of how to uh, split the F up between the, uh, the coast and the bay. Uh, but we do have that as, as available to us through this model. Um, we, to develop the reference points, um, we do projections where, uh, where we have not altered our um, have not altered our, our methods uh, from, our, from the 2013 assessment. So from the model, we get estimates of 1995 SSB, for example, and then our, through our projections, we're finding the fishing mortality that gets us to that SSB over the long term. Uh, a, number of, um, a number of factors can influence um, that projection model, um, but our, uh, this, and this slide just kind of depicts the things that we changed and did not change. So uh, sex ratio did, did not change, and that would affect uh, the proportion female for our female SSB uh, estimates. Uh, natural mortality uh, was unchanged. Uh, maturity I mentioned earlier, that, that was updated, our maturity schedule. Uh, and we have the new uh, statistical catch at age model results. Uh, we updated the, the mean wasted age, um, and maybe one of the, um, Larger changes in the way that we've done the projections is uh, we're using what we're terming a um, hockey stick uh, Beverton Holt stock recruitment model. Um, and the next slide uh, shows that graphically, which I think will help with sort of the, the explanation. So uh, the plot on the left is uh, uh, our stock recruitment relationship with a Beverton Holt stock recruitment relationship fit to it. And this was done external to the model. Um, but one thing that the uh, committee acknowledged was that it doesn't seem like we're reaching the asymptote of that, um, 
of that recruitment curve. Uh, and so the consequence of that is as SSB uh, grows beyond that curve, um, recruitment can kind of wander off into um, unreasonable places, give us estimates of recruitment that, um, that have never been uh, observed. So the way around that, um, what, the, uh, what we wound up doing was uh, taking, using the plot on the right. So we're using um, the Beverton Holt uh, model prediction of recruitment through median SSB, uh, and then after SSB, we're using average recruitment, um, and this prevents that sort of uh, wandering off of uh, high recruitment values that uh, that aren't reasonable. The next plot is a comparison of uh, first sort of a, next, a, a description of our reference points and a comparison of uh, reference points from the previous assessment and the current assessment. And again, as as a, a, a reminder. Our uh, threshold SSB uh, reference point is uh, the 1995 estimate of female spawning stock biomass, and the associated F threshold is the fishing mortality required to get to that SSB level over the long term. Uh, the target is 125% of the threshold level, and the associated F reference point, again, is the fishing mortality um, required to get, uh, to get us to that uh, SSB over the long term. Uh, the bottom portion of the table shows, again, a comparison of uh, reference points. You can see the spawning stock reference points jump uh, quite a bit, and that's uh, due directly to our M change in MRIP estimates. Uh, but the fishing, uh, mortality est um, fishing mortality reference points uh, don't change uh, substantively, uh, didn't change substantively. Uh, and the next plot, uh, the next table shows us our stock status. Uh, we've, again, I, we explored uh, reference points related to 1993 and 1995, um, estimates of female spawning stock biomass. The yellow highlight in this table um, is, is highlighting 95 in particular. Um, and so you can see uh, SSB in 1995 uh, was um, 91, just over 91,000 uh, metric tons. Uh, our estimate of SSB in 2017 uh, is about 68,000 metric tons, so we're uh, under that threshold, uh, and we're um, very certain of that. The probabilities are listed in the, the far right-hand part of that table. We're very certain that that uh, is the case. Um, so the stock is overfished, and the bottom part of that table shows our um, stock status with respect to fishing mortality. Um, our, the F required to get to that 1995 SSB estimate over the long term is uh, 0 0.24, uh, F in 2017 was uh, 0.31, uh, so the stock is also experiencing overfishing, uh, and again, the probability is very high that that's the case. Uh, this is the same plot that I showed earlier, just with the, uh, that um, threshold value uh, now depicted. Um, and so you can see uh, F in 2017 is, uh, is above the threshold, and F has been above the threshold for um, 12 or 13 of the last 14 or 15 years. Uh, the next plot uh, shows female spawning stock biomass relative to the SSB threshold, again, the 1995 uh, estimate of SSB. Uh, and again, you can see 2017 is below that and has been for the last three or four years. Uh, and again, um, uh, we think a lot of this is from uh, what we've seen with our M change in MRIP estimates. Projections. Uh, so these are uh, similar to the projections I described earlier, but we're just doing now six-year projections. We looked at four different scenarios. We looked at uh, a scenario where we maintain, uh, it's assuming that catch in 2017 was maintained over the subsequent six years. Uh, and we looked at three different fishing mortality um, uh, scenarios, one in which we held constant fishing mortality in 2017 for the subsequent six years. Uh, one at which um, the F threshold, assuming we're fishing at the F threshold for uh, the next six years, and then an additional scenario uh, of fishing at the um, F required to get us to the 1993 estimate of SSB over the long term, uh, holding that F value constant over six years. Uh, the methods for this uh, projection were uh, similar, uh, nearly identical to the ones I mentioned earlier for our longer term projections. Um, so this plot is now showing uh, those four different scenarios. So uh, I'll just take a second to kind of walk us through this. Uh, each panel is uh, a different um, is a different SSB is, it, is the SSB trajectory under each of those four projections. So on the far left is the constant catch scenario. So uh, assuming that we were um, catching seven million fish over the next six years, uh, the panel next to that is uh, assuming we fish at the at, uh, at the, the status quo F uh, F in 2017. The panel next to that is assuming that we fished at the F required to get us to the 1993 level of SSB. 
And the last panel on the right is the projection assuming that uh, we fish at the threshold. Uh, the horizontal blue line near the top of the plot is uh, SSB from 1990, the SSB in, uh, from in 1995. The solid black line is the trajectory of SSB from the projection, um, and the dotted lines are the confidence interval around that. And so you can see in each of those four panels, uh, the solid, the solid line, the solid, uh, the trajectory of SSB under all four of those projections, uh, we do expect. Um, female spawning stock biomass to stay below the 1995 estimate of SSB, uh, uh, 1995 estimate of female uh, spawning stock uh, under the four scenarios that we considered. Um, and this plot just shows the probability uh, of being below that um, SSB threshold. If you look at the blue line in particular across all of those, uh, probability is plotted on the Y uh, axis. Uh, the probability is, uh, is, is always above 95 percent that uh, our, our estimate of SSB in 2023 would be below our estimate in uh, below the F threshold. Um, and that is the last slide I have, so uh, I'm happy to, to answer, try and answer any questions. Thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, I know there's thousands of questions. The first step I think we need to consider is how far we want to go today with this regarded as preliminary and and that's up up to the board we've seen a lot and i mean i will editorialize that the assessment is likely to, to be the same when it comes out we don't know that for sure um so how far do we move it, it's clear we need to do something at some point um and i guess we start the discussion now but I have lots of questions. I'm sure other people have it too. Keep in mind, this isn't official, the assessment yet. Question, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and very nice presentation, Mike. <clears throat> One of your first slides showed a list of all the data changes that, that took place um, when this benchmark was conducted. And uh, you mentioned it, I, c I think, periodically throughout your presentation, but I'd like to get a sense from, from you as to if you were to weight the significance of the changes and how they applied to the changes that that occurred as a result to spawning stock biomass and F, you know, is there one one or two particular data inputs that were adjusted that kind of drove those significant, what I would consider significant changes to SSB and F? And I might have a follow up, Mr. Chairman, if, depending on the answer. Uh, thank you. That's a, a great question. Um, we did a, uh, we, I feel like we did a, a fairly robust, a very robust um, bridge building process. Um, the same signal seems to come through um, if we remove surveys, add surveys. Um, we looked at, um, uh, I mentioned the composite Young of the Year index, that changed. Uh, we didn't see a change as a result of that. Um, we are estimating recruitment. Uh, that's, that's something that's uh, missing from the slide. We we're changing slightly the way we're estimating recruitment as a deviation from mean as opposed to a deviation from a Beverton Holt. Uh, we didn't see any impact, um, uh, a negligible impact from that. Um, uh, changing the maturity ogive, uh, uh, minor, minor uh, impact from that. So I, I don't know if anything jumped out at me as being singularly responsible. Um, the model seemed to be very robust to um, the changes we made. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, w I was trying to get to the point that the MRIP recalibrations likely played a major factor in the shifts that we've seen. And um, while I'm absolutely concerned in the declines that we're seeing in spawning stock biomass and, and the stock status as it would stand under, under this evaluation. Um, I'm less concerned about the spawning stock only because the overfish status or overfishing status is based on the reference point that we ultimately decide um, to select. I think this board needs to have that discussion about perhaps modifying reference points when we get to that point. But I have very great concern that a new element to the data inputs is having such a dramatic and, and, and such a dramatic effect uh, to the magnitude of, of what it is we're looking at, specifically that spawning stock biomass that had 
been very shallow for years now seems to be, you know, jumping off the diving board. So just some concerns as to one element's impact uh, to this analysis. Thank you. John McMurray. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just in regards to, to Mike's question, um, it's my understanding that when you have higher landings and you plug that into the VPA, it will return a high, higher value for SSB, not just F. Um, so it kind of evens itself out there. Um, but, but my question really had to do with the, uh, the use of uh, 1993 instead of 1995, and I'm, I'm unsure of why that's happened in this process. I mean, the stock was depleted in 1993. It was rebuilt in 1995. So uh, maybe you could provide some, some explanation there. Yep. Uh, thank you for that question. Yes, uh, the, uh, the committee uh, was uh, responding to the board task of trying to come up with a, a range of a, a suite of reference points. Our, our goal was to bring uh, a, a, a suite to the, the review. Um, 1993 seemed like a, a good year to the committee uh, for a, a number of reasons. One, it's uh, the 1993 year class is, is a very strong year class suggesting that SSB in that year was sufficient to produce that year class under um, perhaps favorable environmental conditions. So that's how that year was selected uh, primarily. John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> thank you, Mike, and thanks to the uh, Stock Assessment Committee. There was clearly a, a massive amount of work that went into this. Uh, just kind of following up on some of the things that we've already heard, um, when I looked, uh, it was pulling out of the, uh, uh, the draft that went for the peer review. It just seems that with each, you know, when they look at the continuity run and the bridge run, the final SSB is much closer to where the threshold would be. But with this new model, as Mike said, it looks like it, you know, jumped off a diving board. It seems like every time the models improve, the stock looks worse. So um, just curious as to, you know, the, how the threshold changed so much between like the bridge run and the, uh, and the uh, base model, as you call it here. So uh, the MRIP is, is uh, we think, at play at that as well. Uh, another thing that, uh, that I think we, that I remember from our sort of bridge building process, um, the 1995 estimate does shift a bit, uh, whether we, depending on whether we use separate Maryland and Virginia indices versus the composite index. So there's a, a signal that's coming through in the composite index, and that seemed to inf influence uh, some of the earlier parts of the time series. Um, but o over, the, over the entire time series, we th think that it's a, a um, the, the changes in MRIP, that, that calibration process is really influencing SSB over the, over the time series. Oh, uh, sure. And just to add to that, I think another one that, another thing that we had looked at is with the MRIP index, we now have age composition information for that. And so before, whereas before it was just sort of a general, we said it represents this chunk of ages, but now we actually went through and developed an index at age. And you can see a stronger signal in terms of a contraction of the age structure that with those years of poor recruitment, you're not seeing that the age structure gets smaller because you're not having as many fish move into the SSB. And you see that more clearly in um, the MRIP index now that we have the age structure. So doing the bridge building run where you don't include that age structure, things look better than when you do include that age structure. And so that's kind of part of what's happening is that the model can see that there's worse information on stock status from the age structure of the index. Rob? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Mike, and everyone who's been involved in the work. Um, the commercial removals are about 10 percent, and I was just wondering, with them being so low and with the history of difficulty associated with pinpointing commercial discards, what was gained by going from three fleet to a two fleet approach? Um, so that's the question. Um, one of the one of the main goals of, of doing that was um, to address one of the board concerns from, from some time ago. That third fleet created problems. Uh, the, I think the board had considered um, fleet reference points for a period of time, and the one sort of wrinkle to that approach was having this commercial discard fleet. Um, 
either of the two directed fleets, uh, uh, if, if either of the two directed fleets uh, could, could be in reasonable shape, uh, not overfishing or overfished, but if the commercial discard fleet did require management action, it created this sort of perverse scenario where to reduce discards, we'd have to increase directed, um, directed catch. So it seemed to present an obstacle to um, management. It was, we were, I think, largely responding to a request from the board um, to help with that, uh, that management question. Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mike, for your presentation. Um, Mike, one of your slides um, had a graphic showing, I think it was biological reference points and the, the terminal year SSB and, and F. I, I don't recall the full details of that slide, but if you could put that back up again, please. Yeah, that, that was the slide. So what I'm trying to figure out here is if we're using the new MRIP data, right, the, the new MRIP data, which shows that that the recreational harvest estimate is whatever it was, 150% of what the non-calibrated data shows, right? So if the catch was that much greater, then to, to account for that, doesn't the spawning stock biomass have to be bigger by an approximate amount? Right? And, and how is that taken into account in this table or in the assessment? That's, that's what I'm trying to figure out here. Thank you. Yep, uh, that's a, a great question. The, our, those percentages were for numbers of fish, so I, I think that's one, one explanation is um, it, 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 we wouldn't necessarily see a one-to-one -one increase uh, based on um, uh, immature fish, so it's, it may be the maturity curve that's, uh, that's accounting for that. Go ahead, Emerson. Thank you for the follow-up. But even if that is numbers of fish, then the, the poundage of harvest is greater, and therefore the SSB had to be greater to account for that additional harvest, right? Um, yeah, and we do, so um, I'm trying to... Oh, um, so yeah, we do see uh, a, a pretty substantial change uh, on, of, of, in reference points in, in direct response to of, of, um, not necessarily a, a doubling, but um, probably on that, uh, close to about that, the increase, the level of increase. So for example, 60,000 to uh, 60,000 uh, metric ton threshold to about 90,000 th uh, metric tons. Um, uh, not, not quite as much, but I, I, I don't have a, 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 a great answer for why it's not a one-to-one -one change. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't, don't mean to monopolize uh, um, uh, the discussion here. Um, but y yeah, my question really wasn't why is there not a one-to-one, -one -one, okay? I just, I just didn't know where that increase was, was was coming into an account coming into account, so it, I guess it was this slide here that I had in the back of my mind. Um, so what you're saying then is that the previous uh, for for spawning stock biomass, for instance, the previous reference point was fifty seven thousand six twenty six for the threshold, and the what's being used to determine overfished and overfishing status out of the latest assessment now is 91,436. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mike. Um, what we're seeing is, of course, consideration of the stock as a whole. Was, um, could you quickly review for me what, if, if anything was done with regard to um, spawning area specific stocks such as Chesapeake versus Delaware River versus Hudson River and would if if those had been broken out would the results have been different uh, for any of those systems 
So um, I, uh, that's a, a trickier question to answer because we don't have final we don't have final uh, results from the uh, the Northeast Science Center. But the short answer to the question is. Um, we, we did uh, embark on the mic uh, a migration model, uh, a stock-specific model that models explicitly the Chesapeake stock uh, and explicitly a combined or mixed Hudson River Delaware Bay stock or Delaware River stock. Um, I'm not sure how much I, 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 can, I guess I can say objectively what the results were. Uh, it did show, uh, it did paint a, a different picture. Um, uh, the review panel, our understanding again from our conversations at the uh, review in November were that the review panel did not think that model was suitable for management at this point. So I'm reluctant to say to go too much into those results, um, but uh, I mentioned earlier the work that the, the, the committee did, and again Gary Nelson in particular, with uh, that this migration model it was a tremendous amount of work. Uh, their committee, our, our committee had great confidence in the model. We thought it was uh, we wouldn't have brought it forward to the review if we didn't think it was suitable. Um, but we needed to convince a review panel, and um, our understanding is that we, we, we're not quite there yet with them. But uh, it, the short answer is it sort of paints a slightly different, it paints a slightly different picture, not terribly different uh, on a combined stock basis, um, but a slightly different picture. Um, and I, I'm not sure how much more I can say about it without, I, don't, I certainly don't want to put words into the mouth of the reviewers until their re reports are released. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Mike or, or Katie, so what will we see next meeting that's not included in this report now? I assume this information will be the same if, if it passes muster. And uh, what additional things will we see? So the, the complete report will have, um, the, the complete report from the SARC will have a complete description of the migration model that did not pass, as well as sort of the results and the output of that, so you can evaluate the work that was done for that. Um, but it will also have the, as well as more details on, um, we gave you a summary report on the results of this, but obviously the final report will be much more detailed, um, several hundred pages worth of um, actual assessment information. But you will also then receive the peer review panel report where they will um, basically explain in more detail why the migration model failed, what needs to be done. They were favorable in the sense of they thought this was a good idea and we should continue to work on it, and they gave us um, additional feedback on how to go forward in terms of data collection and modeling approaches. So that information will be included. Um, as well as sort of um, an assessment of the of what they chose as the preferred model, but the the numbers that you're seeing are not something that is going to change um, from from that report. Okay, and that's that's very important. That what we're seeing now is what we can chew on. Um, Doug, yeah, I was curious about you know seeing that the model is showing that. The SSB has been declining for a while, and you mentioned that you had gotten the MRIP data split out into age, uh, which is good, and that probably some of the information in that uh, influenced um, the model's output of showing that, you know, we're having a decline in recent years, and a steep decline in SSB in recent years. Did the other um, fisheries independent uh, surveys sh show, you know, a similar decline in SSB, the, the fish that are in the SSB age group? We did in general see that. Um, uh, the one exception that comes, the, the exception that comes to mind is the Maryland spawning stock survey. I don't know that we, that probably showed more of a sort of stasis or static. Um, it didn't, we, I don't think we saw quite the contraction, but in the other surveys, we, we really did. Uh, the Delaware, uh, Delaware, uh, um, trawl survey, New Jersey, New Jersey trawl, Connecticut, Long Island Sound, uh, we did see that ex uh, contraction, and again, uh, in the, uh, our MRIP index as well. Uh, Russ? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, Mike. Excellent presentation, as always, and thanks to everybody else who's working on this. One of the things that jumped out at me was that 48 percent of the removals for 2017, I believe, came from recreational discards. Uh, that's kind of disturbing to me, uh, for one. And then just looking at table one in the summary, I, I, I see that, you know, it's the first time that removals from discards was higher than actual 
harvest for the recreational fishery since 1998. So I, I, my question is, you know, did the technical committee discuss this, stock assessment committee discuss this, and, and do you have any thoughts on, on where that's headed? And it's a very disturbing thing for someone who's, I mean, does not like to see dead discards. I mean, it, it just, it bothers me. So if you have any insight on that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, thank, thank you for that question. Um, my, my memory isn't super clear as to how much the committee talked about that. My general sense is that we see that increase in commercial, uh, I'm sorry, re uh, recreational dead releases uh, just around the time of uh, implementing Addendum 4. Um, so uh, one of the things that are when we sort of all uh, we did our conservation equivalency and we sort of come up with our projections of what we think will be the required reduction. Uh, we are never able to quite account for angling behavior. Um, and so some of those things might be at play, uh, addendum four and, and some angling behavior that was either unanticipated. Um, also uh, the, some, some uh, um, uh, strong recruitment classes that are coming through, uh, but I don't, I don't know that the committee talked about it explicitly. It's, it's, my memory's not clear on it. I would think that that's an issue we're going to have to talk about um, as part of the actions coming up. Probably not today, but certainly that's going to be in the package we're going to have to look at because um, we can't ignore 50 percent of the mortality on, on this stock. Uh, Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, kind of to follow along on that uh, vein, um, so re recreational release mortality increased since the last stock assessment. Is that correct? And, and if so, then I have a follow-up. Uh, yeah, we, we, we do see uh, an inc we're seeing an increase in trend, especially in the last couple of years. Um, follow-up would be, uh, could that be an indication of the declining sp spawning stock biomass in that there are less legal fish available to catch? Um. It's hard. Uh, I, I, short answer is I'm not sure. I think it's hard for us to to, to know all the reasons why fish might be discarded. Um, so I, I'm not going to have a great answer for you. Um, but I think a combination of um, cohort year, uh, younger fish moving through. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't. I don't have a, a clear answer for you. I apologize. Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mike, great job. Uh, you know, really detailed report for something you weren't able to detail uh, very much. So I really appreciate all the work that you guys did on that. Um, so I'm getting back to uh, what new information we might get at the the uh, next meeting. And one thing I was wondering about is, did we get any guidance? I know you guys looked at a suite of different reference points. Um, did you get any guidance from the peer reviewers as to, uh, I, I know they wouldn't pick them for you, but did you get anything that we are going to be able to use when we start thinking about the reference points as they are now or, or what they should be? Uh, thank, thank you, uh, thank you for that question. Um, so our, our plan um, was initially to bring, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the suite of reference points to the review panel and exactly as you indicated, not have them select, but we wanted to engage in a dialogue with them on range and, and, and possibly methods. Uh, we reached out to the Northeast Science Center and um, uh, I, I, I won't necessarily say they discouraged us from doing that, but it wasn't an explicit term of reference to have a dialogue on that. So um, I, I don't, I, I, my, my, my personal expectation would not uh, be to receive guidance in the documents that come forward. Um, Katie, would you? Um, so, yeah. Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for the second opportunity for a question. I think it's important for the board um, to get a sense as to what's coming. Um, so I don't know if you can, can you put up your composite recruitment graph? Mike, you did a nice job of, you know, early in the time series, recruitment was very poor. Uh, we had spikes in recruitment in the, I guess it was the mid-2000s, late 90s, 2000s. And now we have a time period where we've had some poor years, but also um, some strong year classes, the 2011, the, the 2015, 
15 and the 20, I guess that's 15, 16. Um, could you provide the board with, as far as inclusion of those, those fish in the SSB estimate, are there proportions of those classes that are part of the SSB that we're evaluating now, or do you anticipate, I, I can imagine the 2011s are getting very close, to, if not all the way recruited to the SSB, but the other two year classes, I think are gonna play a significant role in, in boosting to some degree the SSB in future years. I just, if you can give the board some perspective on that, would be great. <clears throat> Sure, uh, thank you for that question. So our, our maturity schedule does allow for um, maturity of, uh, of some of those smaller fish, uh, but we see very very few mature fish at younger ages. So uh, as an example, um, up through age four or five, we're at only at about 20 to 25% maturity. So a, a, a small proportion in those early years, um, those larger two year, year classes, I wouldn't expect a lot of SSB to be reflected from those year classes. Emerson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, coming back to me. But just based on, on the question that Mike asked, so is there any discussion or projection in the assessment about what's going to happen with SSB when the 2011, um, when, when that year class becomes fully mature, which is going to happen fairly soon? And similar question for 2015 year class. Thank you. Yeah, I think the um, the projections, we did a limited number of projections, but uh, I think that those are exactly the year classes that we're seeing sort of um, coming through and we see this upswing in SSB. Um, I don't, we're going to try to get that slide up in just a second. Um, but I think those are those year classes. Uh, we're sort of uh, under these um, status quo fishing, uh, uh, fishing mortalities. We still see SSB increasing and our suspicion is, is, it, is it is those uh, those year classes moving through. Okay. Yeah, I'll stay on this uh, theme as well. And so it's important to keep in mind that the recruitment plot, and you don't have to switch, but the recruitment plot we just looked at, it's a model generated recruitment plot. There is a retrospective pattern in recruitment that was one of the more good uh, retrospective in general for the model, but that was of all of the things you looked at, one of the worst ones. So I, my I guess the comment I'm making is we should be careful about how many uh, chickens out of those we uh, count. Um, and the other thing that we'll need to pay close attention to when we get to this point are the recruitment assumptions that go into these projections. Mike, I thought you said you guys used the uh, spline Beverden holt model here. So we'll have to think about that in relation to you know, some of that recruitment information as well. So um, I think it's good to think forward a little bit, but we should do so cautiously. Rob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mike, I, I guess this is gonna be asked out of just uh, falling out of the uh, technical world a while back. Um, and I don't know how the statistical catch at age model behaves in terms of past information, but it seemed one of those figures you had up, um, not the catch composition fix, uh, picture, but the earlier one, which showed that a lot of the change from MRIP, where it was 140% overall, and I think you commented it went from 40 to 400%, depending on where we we're looking. A lot of the elevation was before 1993, it seemed. and compared to years after that. And so on the harvest, the B2s looked a little bit different. They didn't have exactly that same pattern. But I guess what I was wondering is, does the model, is the impact from those earlier years with the changes of MRIP as substantial as in the later years? Um, in other words, does it carry through? And then I might have a little follow-up. Um, so I, 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 I think I understand your question. Uh, in the statistical catch at age model, our earlier years are our most uncertain years in the model. Um, I, 
the plot that I'm looking at, um, I don't know if we can if we can put this one up. I just want to make sure I'm looking, uh, thinking of the same plot that you are. We're, we're going to try to get it up in just a second. Um, uh, uh, slide eight. Is, is this the figure you were thinking of? That was the second one. There was one where you had prior to that, I thought, where at the top it had the harvest, at the bottom it had the B2s, and it showed the uh, changes from MRIP. Uh, this, this plot? Yep. yep. Yes, that's it. So, um, yeah, I, I, maybe the reason I was thinking of the following plot was um, I, I mentioned earlier that the percentages are much larger. Um, I, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure I understand you. I don't want to. I'll try to answer your question. If I'm misunderstanding it, please just please let me know. I'll try again. Um, when I when I think of the subsequent plot, the largest differences are happening sort of after the, the lines are getting farther apart after 19, 1995 or 2000 or so. Um, and so, yeah, I mean the model is um, is, is making adjustments for all of those. It's um, the, our estimates of abundance are going to be most uncertain earlier in the time period. Uh, but all of the, all the catch estimates are, are uh, making their way through the model, um, and that sort of smaller difference, uh, uh, smaller difference increase, uh, at least in the, the part of the time period that I'm thinking about, um, should, should is, is of course reflected in the model. But um, I, don't, I don't feel like I'm answering your question. So um, let me try and help because you're nice to to uh, give it a shot here. Uh, so in the upper graph. The before 1993, you have the average line, but then you have what the changes in MRIP caused, I think, right? In, Correct. In the brown bars. Correct. And it seems to me that it's above average quite a bit in the early years. Um, and so I was wondering, does that have equal influence in the model as the later years? And it seems that you said, it's all considered it does since it's a forward projection model um, but where I was thinking was did the and is it uh, sort of heresy but do you always have to look at a starting point of data so you looked at 1982 so for example what would a run look like if you didn't have those higher years which are clustered more towards the early time series and do you, do you look at that in any way? Um, and, you know, I say that because I remember, you know, when we started out with striped bass, there was a VPA in 1996. This is a different model. I understand that. Um, there were probably 13 years of data. We're talking now about 37 years of data. Um, you know, are there ways, if, if we know, and I suspect this is the case, that there's also variability from what I've heard um, presented by Dave Van Voorhees, about certain years that there's still variability that is there some way to look at this differently um, that if all of a sudden you get beyond 1993 there's somewhat a better representation although I think you could say well in the mid years you're low so is that something that was even talked about um, yeah, thank you for clarifying that question. Um, I apologize for getting it wrong the first time. So we did talk about as one sensitivity run, actually, rather than doing a, a retrospective, kind of doing a reverse retrospective. Um, and regrettably, we just sort of ran out of time and weren't able to do that. One way that, um, now that I understand your question better, um, one way that we are accounting for some of this information in the current model is we do have CVs on um, in, uh, on different different years of the cash, there's some years of, of the cash that we're more certain of than others, and so we can give the model a little more leeway early in the time series when we may not be quite as certain of catch. Um, so that's one way that, that that can be incorporated into the model. Um, but the more explicit sort of shaving off early years uh, was discussed explicitly, um, and it was part of our table of sensitivity runs. We just weren't able to complete that. John? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I'm having a hard time following a lot of this. It, so the 2011s, they are fully recruited? Uh, 
2011s, we um, they, they would be about um, seven or eight now. So yeah, we would expect to see um, uh, that year class working its way through. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I can tell you one thing, uh, both personally and speaking on behalf of, of the recreational fishing community, they are not available. I mean, certainly there are flashes here and there of those fish, but they're not the panacea everybody thinks that they are. Um, I mean, that seems to be pretty clear in the stock assessment, but it's, it's also very clear to those of us that, that are out there targeting them. They're just they're not around. Um, and yeah, and, and forgive me. Uh, so our, our our selectivity curves in, in the Atlantic coast, uh, we do assume full selectivity at age 13, 14, or 15, uh, and so those would not be fully selectable. That uh, that should generally jibe with your your uh, your observation. Um, not not fully selectable, uh, but uh, partially selectable. Mike, to to that point, can you see the 2011? year class moving through the catch at age as a, as a strong year class? Yeah, I, I actually was just looking at this before. Uh, so yes, you can, and if we can go back to that figure actually, um, so. So, and I think what we see in the catch at age lines up with what John was saying, which is that you can see, so you see the bigger bubbles are more fish in those age classes and in those years. And you can see on the ocean side, you can see the 2011 is a bigger set of bubbles moving through. But I would, relative to what is around them, however, I think the, you know, it is for sure not as um, abundant as, I think that's the 2003 year class that above that's much larger. So yes, we do see them, they are more abundant than some of the other year classes, but they are not, as you were saying, the panacea for SSB. Any more questions to the assessment? That's a lot of information. Um, so we move to the next item, which is discussing the next step. Clearly, yeah, clearly we there are next steps needed, but I'm I'm uncertain which way we go here. Um, do we charge the TC with some more projections under all the projections they provided under all the scenarios? Um, through 23, we don't come close to the reference points that are proposed. Um, do we charge them with looking at some other things? What F do we actually need to think about achieving to, to get the SSB? Are these the right SSBs that we want going forward? And are we looking at an addendum? Are we looking at an amendment? But if we don't ask for something now and get it started, we're, we've lost three months already, and we really need whatever we do to be in place by the next fishing season. So I, I would suggest we um, we move on something today and open to suggestions. Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, actually, I'll start with a question for Max. Uh, what is the wording in the plan that requires us to take action uh, when the stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring? How, how, what's the wording? don't have the exact wording in front of me, but if we were in a position to accept the results, that would trigger four of the management triggers, two of which are related to fishing mortality, two of which are related to SSB. Those that are related to fishing mortality require uh, reducing F to the target within a year. Those related to SSB charge the board to increase SSB to a timeline that they need to choose. Um, there's some restrictions on that timeline length, but. Follow up, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, um, so a management action, uh, are both, uh, management action can accomplish both those by addendum? Yes. Thank you. Uh, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, also a clarification on the uh, the amendment, if I understand it, 
if we were to change the reference points at that point we would have to go to a new amendment right the actual 1995 SSB is part of the the amendment six um, actually there's a lot of flexibility in the adaptive management section of amendment six uh, I was just reviewing this prior to the board meeting and almost everything is covered in the addendum process except for management objectives and, and goals. Um, just about everything else can be done through an addendum, including reference points. And so, uh, you know, in regard to timelines, we are in such a different spot that was never covered in any addendum or amendment. As of last assessment, the stock was doing okay. We had some concerns. And, you know, with brand new data, the entire assessment has changed to no one's fault, but we've pulled back the curtain and the wizard looks quite different now. Um, so the, the timelines, uh, you know, we, we, we need to think about that. Mike. The wizard is old and tired now. Um, so I think Richie, I think his back and forth with Max was exactly what we should task the TC in evaluating, which is let's take the current amendment framework that we have, determine whether or not through, if we were to accept the terms that were just reported to us, um, did triggers get triggered? And if so, what's the consequence of that before the board? I think that's completely acceptable as far as a, as a tasking to come back before the board <clears throat> so that we can understand what the management implications are for those decisions that we'll have to make the next time we get together. Um, I do want to just provide my opinion on, as a word of caution to stepping back in time and kind of redoing Addendum 4, which I wasn't on the board at the time, but the board across, across the board, states were required to take reductions through a paper and pencil exercise um, and five years later, it doesn't seem as if what we did did a whole lot of good as far as re recovering the stock. And I just, I feel as if <clears throat> we're in a different place in time right now. Amendment 6 was developed back in the time period when we had a super abundance of stripers in the ocean. And we no longer have that based on this assessment. So, you know, I... I would be supportive of, of a more comprehensive look at all of the elements uh, that are in Amendment 6 for potential change, which would be goals and objectives, trigger mechanisms, reference points, um, time periods. All those elements, I think we need to reconsider them. You know, we did a survey a year or two ago. I don't remember when that was. Um, but that survey, there was a clear indication that the board was kind of split as far as do we want to have a, you know, a super abundance of large striped bass in the ocean or do we want to have harvest as part of that as well? So I do think that we would be foolish um, to go back, and this is kind of to Russ's point and Richie's point earlier. If you look at the last five years, it's the last five years where our dead discards have been greater than the actual harvest on the rec in the recreational fishery. That's a really big problem. And we can say all day that we want to reduce F. Let's, let's reduce F. But if we, don't accomplish, if we don't succeed by solving a problem, we're going to be right back here again five years from now when the next assessment's done. Because we haven't, we've exacerbated the problem by increasing size limits, creating situations where fishermen have to cull through 20, 30, 40 fish before they can keep one. Um, we did that, and I hope we don't do that again. Uh, I would think that through an amendment or an addendum process, we could be more creative in our approach to try to solve the problem, um, which is kind of the, f the focus of that problem would be on dead discards. Ultimately, we're taking down removals to accomplish what it is we need to accomplish. So I, you know, I foresee a little bit of a longer time period. Maybe it can get done before the beginning of next season. I just, I hope that we don't act as a board swiftly and find ourselves making the same mistakes we made five years ago, and we based on the review of this um, assessment, we've really accomplished very little. Thank you. 
Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, obviously, one of the issues we have here is we don't have the final, uh, um, uh, final peer-reviewed uh, stock assessment here. But we're anticipating getting that shortly, hopefully. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is um, make a motion that would propose uh, to task the TC with some very basic tasks just to start getting an information on what the impacts are from this assessment, what we're going to, what we could potentially need to do just as a minimum um, um, with this assessment um, based on what's currently in the management plan. Um, not start an addendum at this point or an amendment, but let's get some information so that we can see um, what the impact of this is and what we, you know, maybe an idea, a uh, single idea of what we might need to do. Uh, I agree discards is an issue. I don't see that discards have exceeded harvest in the last Five years, but certainly in 2017, it was it was very evident that we were heading in that direction. So, with that said, I have a a motion, and I want to caveat it that this tasking of the TC, the work is only to begin after we receive the final benchmark assessment, the report, and the peer review of it. But the task, the TC, with providing the board with a report that shows reduction the 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 reductions in harvest needed to reduce f to f threshold and f target and when i'm referring to that i'm referring to the ones i saw up there based on the uh um, 2015 SSB, it was at 0.24 for the threshold and 0.197 for the target. And then I'd also, I, I don't want to over task the SSC with providing a suite of, of, you know, season size limits, but I'd like to see an example, just a single example for each uh, what it would take to, to reduce the harvest by that amount. So my um, motion goes on to say, also provide one example of rec bag and size limit combinations, and in parentheses say, if necessary, seasonal restrictions needed to achieve these reductions. One or A, on the coast, and B, in Chesapeake Bay, and to report back to the board in May. Can you? Is there a second? Justin Davis, second. Can you make that as an, an amendment? Could you make that suggestion as an amendment? That makes sense. To, uh, Discussion, Doug. It could be. I just. Richie. Um, question Would it make sense to also add uh, the appropriate percent reduction in the commercial quota? So that's that's a that's a question to Max or the chair or <laughs> I'm I'm sorry I was talking with my oh. crew over here could you please repeat the question <laughs> sure um, does it make sense to add to this the appropriate reduction in commercial quota corresponding, corresponding uh, to the motion I'm if you wanted to add that I'm sure you could um, what I was just talking about with my group, if you will, was when it comes to providing one example of a bag and size limit uh, 
combination. I mean, as we know right now, there are uh, a plethora of different regulations implemented across the coast, and especially bay versus the rest of the coastal fisheries. I don't know if, I mean, they could certainly put uh, an example together, but I fear that that comes in front of the board and you guys look at it and say that's nothing what we wanted to see or, or uh, you, there's a million combinations that they could put together. So I, I'm looking for a little more direction for them. Doug. I'm not saying that this is something we're going to put in a, a plan. All I'm trying to do is show the board and show the public about an example of what kind of changes might be needed to accomplish those reductions in F to the threshold and target. You can pick anything. I don't care. Uh, and that's why I gave you, the, you know, I prefer bag size limit, but if, if you need to go to a seasonal restriction coast-wide, and this would be like a, a coast-wide because we have different regulations in Chesapeake Bay than we do along the, 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 oak, the coast, um, to just Give us one example. I know this board can come up with hundreds of different combinations we want them to look at, but I'm not, that's not the point right now. The point is for us to visualize and the public to visualize what kind of things it's going to take to accomplish this. Just one example. So, Doug, a couple other things that would be helpful for the technical committee. Um, one is a timeline. So the triggers in Amendment 6 specify F to the target within one year. So it, if we could add a timeline to the motion, perhaps. And also probabilities. If you recall, back in Addendum 4, that 25% reduction in Addendum 4 had a 50% probability of achieving F to the target. So does the board have a certain probability they're comfortable with? 2020, 50% probability, just as a, to get you going. Doug, would you anticipate SSB projections associated with those? I'm more, it could, I mean, we could, we could pile on them, but I, I, my, my goal is what's it going to take to end overfishing in a year? In a year. Okay. So that's where we get to point. 197 may not be enough to get us back very quickly. There may be a restoration I, F we need to move to, is as horrendous as that sounds. And that may be a further thing that we would have to, you know, a restoration for SSB maybe in the future, but let's get the first thing on the table, um, at least from my perspective. Okay, and this is going sort of how I thought it would be. We only plan on three hours, and, and this is this is an eight-hour meeting we're leading up to, so we do have to watch the time a little bit. Um, but we have a second. So comments on Doug's motion? I have a couple already. Justin? Good. Emerson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, in Mike's presentation, did I understand it correctly that there are a couple of different sets of reference points that were suggested and, and we're waiting for feedback from the peer review about those suggested reference points or, or did I misunderstand? Um, that, that's, um, there are an, uh, two reference points that we brought forward to the um, three, we brought a 1993, 1995 SSB, and 125% of 1995. But we don't ex we don't uh, we don't anticipate getting any feedback on on alternate reference points, only on um, stock status determination relative to 1995 uh, SSB. Go ahead, Emerson. Thank you. So I could probably answer my own question by looking through the reference um, documents here, but I'm going to ask it. So um, the up so might that F threshold and F target change based on the uh, on the peer review, or are they probably going to remain the same? Because if there's a chance of them changing, then we don't then we may want to change this motion. Uh, we our expectation is that the numbers won't change. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so it, you've already covered part. I was going to also suggest we needed a, a risk probability, and, and so we got that. Uh, the 50 percent uh, is a good starting point. Um, I think this is a good. I, I also feel a, a sense of urgency and a sense to kind of get moving here. But I, I thought Mike's comments were good um, as well. I think we want to you know, really think this through. So I think what Doug has offered is a good start to kind of get a sense of this. The one concern I have is about the the one, you know, regulation example. I, I, I'm i kind of thinking about what that might look like, and I think it's just going to be alarming. And, and I don't know what value we get out of that, and I can see just the discussion to get to that one example, we're, we're saying TC give us one, they're gonna have a battle at the TC to figure out what that one is going to be that comes to us. So I'm not pushing this too strongly at this point, but that might be something we might think about peeling out of this motion. Just getting this very basic information of what is it gonna take to get us back to the reference points that we have already. And then I think in our next meeting, we'll have a lot more information with which to, to offer more guidance, because that's what I'm truly struggling with. I feel a need to get moving on this, but I have no idea what guidance to provide the technical committee at this point, because we don't have a lot to work with. Doug, would you consider an amendment? Um, I'd be more than willing to, if someone wants to uh, make an amendment, my, my goal was our, I gave the, clearly on the coast we're at one fish, so you, it's going to be difficult to change the bag limit. Can you raise the size limit high enough to accomplish this or not? I have no idea. So that would be a very simple thing for them to do. Okay, how far up on the size limit we have to go in the, um, on you know, the coast or in the bay, uh, just as an example. And then um, my, my concern is saying, okay, we got to take a, uh, you know, a 25 or 30 percent reduction and have to get to this point, or, or we need to reduce harvest by this million fish. The, the public and us are not going to have any concept at all about what it takes to do that. And that's my purpose in trying to see if there's a possibility that they could give us a simple example, even if it's just changing the size limit in the bay and the coast um, uh, to get to these things. But if it, you can't do it, um, then, you know, I gave them the, the uh, second op option of, you know, well, maybe you need to put it, we need to put in a, uh, as additional seasonal restrictions. And I know that we're going to be having lots of discussions about this in the future, but without, you can tell me we're going to cut it by two million fish, and that means nothing to the, the public. It, it sounds like a friendly emotion. Uh, <laughs> change is not in the works. Would you like to make a motion like that to change it? Okay. Um, John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm opposed to this. I think we know what this will turn out. It's going to be drastic. It's going to be alarming. It's going to really create expectations in the public that things are so terrible we have to do, take drastic action now. I think this is the time. We know we're going to have to take actions. This is the time to start an amendment process where we rethink our management options. We look at different reference points. We kind of go back to the drawing board. As Mike said, we've had five years of a 25 percent cutback. It hasn't done the trick so far, so maybe we just need to rethink the whole process. I think I, without having the TC report, we know it's going to be pretty drastic, especially if we're going to try to get to that target F in one year. Thank you. Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to potentially add something to the mix that this motion might cover. Um, we're putting 
all of the reduction in harvest, we're using the reduction in harvest to achieve the targets and the threshold. What, what if, um, I'm harking back to the comment that Russ Allen made regarding uh, uh, recreational discard mortality being higher than, uh, than harvest mortality. Um, what if we were to attempt to reduce recreational discard mortality and make that part of the mix? And how much could we expect to reduce recreational discard mortality? Is it enough to even consider trying to do? I'm thinking of Maryland's proposal over the past couple of years to reduce recreational discard mortality uh, using innovations like circle hooks and, and that kind of, and educational awareness, that kind of thing. Thank you. Katie or, or Mike, to, to that point, I know it gets really complicated because a million age two fish is a lot less fishing mortality than a million age eight fish. Is and I'm not saying this now, I think it's something we need to look at. Is we know the age structure of the discard. We, ha we do have information on that. So we rely on um, some MREP sampling for that. They do have um, observers on headboats measuring the size of fish that are thrown back alive. We do have information from angler logbook programs where people tell us measure the fish they throw back versus the fish they keep. So we do have information on the, the size structure of the discards. Um, I would also say we, we definitely, when we do this analysis, we look at we assume when we do the bag and size limit analysis for striped bass that if we throw, if we raise that size limit to from 28 to 30, then those fish that are will be thrown back and a certain amount of them will die. And so that goes back into, we account for that recreational discard when we count for the total mortality of the removals that those um, regulation changes will accomplish. But I think the question of how do we reduce, and the other thing to keep in mind with striped bass is we release about 10 times as many fish as we actually harvest. So even if you convert 50% of those releases to harvest, that's more than the recreational dead discards because only about on average over the coast 10 percent of them die be when they're thrown back alive but I think the question of how do you balance that out especially with strong ear classes moving through is something that the TC would consider when looking at these bag and size limit analyses okay thanks uh, Ray did you have a comment okay Mike thank you mr. chairman I'm gonna need to get a privacy screen on my iPad. Roy, I think, is reading my notes directly um, that I'm typing to myself. But I wanted to make a similar point to Roy's and maybe change, change the wording, Roy, in such a way. I, I understand the, the interest in actually converting the dead discards into harvestable fish. But what if, through this TC process, <clears throat> we get a sense as to what, impact, what effect discards would have by increasing size and limits? So if, if we're going to have one example on the coast and one example in the Chesapeake Bay of increasing size limits, is there, a, is there a way, technically, to estimate how many more fish you're now going to have to in, interact with and have as part of your B2s so that stakeholders can understand that by increasing size limits, you're ultimately just creating more dead discards and exacerbating the problem? I think it would be, if we can add it to that, I don't know where it fits in there, um, perhaps after providing one example of recreational bag and size limit combination, if necessary, seasonal restrictions and effect on B2s or effect on live releases, I think it would be helpful for the public to know what those estimates look like, what those scary estimates look like. So uh, are we getting... This is kind of like a David Pierce uh, motion at this point. Um, should there be a separate motion, or Doug, would you be amenable to adding that? Someone can gracefully add that into uh, the motion without violating the Pierce rule. I'd be glad to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's part. It sounds like, by what Katie just said, that's going to be part of the analysis, anyways. And, you know, as, as long as in the report you can explicitly bring that out, I, I think we're, it, that's what I thought it was. It, yes, I, I agree. We should look at 
we should see that kind of information too. Mike, do you see some language you could add to this that would satisfy you? It's, if it's going to be part of what's reported as it's already stated, I, that's well beyond technically how I, what I understand, how, what we're going to get back, what the feedback we're going to get. But if we're able to see with a 32 inch one fish bag limit on the, in the ocean under this scenario, if that's the, if that's the scenario we have, if we're able to see based on an estimate of what, how many new live releases that we're going to have as, as an effect of that, that would be what ideally what I'd like to see as, as well as in the bay. And if it's already packaged in there, then I'm, it's, there's no reason to complicate this any more than it already is. And if it's in there, then fine, I'll absolutely support the motion moving forward. But I have to ask Katie or, or, or Nicole or somebody. There's, there's a piece, I, and I'll ask Katie to comment, the, the piece about how many are you going to have to discard to get to the new size one. That's not what you're talking about. Um, that's obviously much harder to do because it depends on the size and age structure of the population. I think it is something that TC is interested in pursuing and has been talking about internally when we do these kinds of calculations. And I think the fact that we know you're interested in that means that we will try to provide some analysis that can um, address that question. Obviously, we can't guarantee that this is the exact number that you have to go through, but I think we can sort of take that into consideration as we do these calculations. John. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A question and then a comment. Uh, I, I want to be clear before I support this that this puts us on track for on the ground management action in 2000 or potential management action in 2021. I'm sorry, 2020. Um, that, so that all depends on how, you know, what kind of document we're initiating down the road amendment or addenda an addenda is obviously more streamlined amendment takes a little bit longer um, and it also depends on you know the time of the year that actual final approval of that document would be if that's at the beginning of the year um, versus more mid-season you know you some fisheries could already be operating thank you so uh, you could have just said yes <laughs> this does put us on track should we go uh, the addenda route, um, and, that, and that's good to hear, and I can support it. Um, but I also wanted to respond to some of the comments around the table, particularly uh, the fear that this is going to be drastic. And I would just add um, that this is a really important fishery, and it is to a large extent driven by availability, not necessarily how many you could put in the cooler, but how many fish are around. And with that said, in the grand scheme of things, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if we have to go up several inches in a size uh, and, and not mess with the bag limit, that's not going to be catastrophic. What is going to be catastrophic is if that availability continues to decline, particularly for the part of the recreational fishing community that targets these fish from the beach, which is both culturally and economically important, uh, if we continue down this road uh, and if we if we don't keep the promises that we made in amendment six that's what's going to happen we're going to be in a really bad situation so i would encourage the board to uh to go this route but to try to take action uh expediently thank you rob Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I've heard uh, two board members talk about, and if may be necessary, a seasonal closure. And since Amendment 5, there hasn't been a lot about seasonality in this fishery, about truncating seasons when there's been problems with the stock. And I just hope that that gets a pretty good look because we're hearing about discards, um, raising size limits all the time, in my mind, is really not that effective. Um, so I hope that the use of seasons gets a pretty good characterization, because if your season's closed, you may have catch and release. That's about it. You may have recoupment, 
once your season opens because everyone's in a fervor to get out and fish. So we understand that as well. Um, but that's nothing such as always having as much season as possible. And I understand that that's what the fishing public wants. They want the longest season possible, no matter what the species is. But at the same time, we have some testimony through this last addendum four that size limits may not be the way to go all the time. Yes, we went to one fish, but in a lot of cases, I remember the information from some of the coastal states where one fish would be okay. Um, you know, there's certainly a lot of catch and release too. So I hope that's not an add-on. I hope that's right up there in the front row with size limits changes and bag limit changes. And I hope the technical committee can advise us just how much that's been used in the past since 1995. Um, I don't think a whole lot, but I mean, if we're truly going to be, you know, conservation minded, it may be that size limits aren't the way to go. Thank you. So seasons is something that we have not looked at before and it's not specified in Amendment 6. It is something that we can look at if the board wants us to look at it, but that is something that will be more work and more detailed. It will have to be done on a state-by-state -state basis because the seasons in all the states do vary quite a bit right now. So I'm not sure we will have that ready by the May meeting, but it's definitely something that we can look at if the board desires us to. May I respond? Okay, so Go ahead, I'm, I'm aligned with Doug's idea that we just want to get some glimpse here. We want the public to know that this is something being taken seriously. No expectation for any final results or anything else like that. I just don't want it to be neglected by the time we really start to work on this. Thank you very much. Uh, Justin, then Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a question for the technical folks. I'm wondering if this motion would be more appropriately worded reductions in removals, because what we're really trying to capture here is how many fewer fish will we need to remove to get down to that F threshold. And, and obviously, as we change size limits, we might be increasing discards. There's mortality associated with that. There's been concern expressed about that around the table. So I'm just wondering if changing that little change in wording might help sort of capture that dynamic better. I mean, I think we, the technical committee, would have interpreted that at harvest as removals, but if the board wants to be more specific, it certainly wouldn't hurt us. Dennis. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Assume, not assuming, but with the importance of this issue, and assuming that we come back in May and make a decision to start an addendum in order to get regulations in place by 2020, we have, that gives us maybe eight months. Is it possible that we can get that done in that time? And would it be necessary of a good idea to consider having additional meetings to expedite this in order to have a finished product by the end of this calendar year? So talking about an addendum here, uh, assuming the board initiates an addendum in May, that timeline would have, you know, no hiccups along the road. Uh, final approval would be in October of this year. A question, Max, if, if time and area closures were part of it, can that be an addendum since they don't seem to be in the toolbox yet? Yes, but I'm going to check right now just to verify that response. Thank you. Okay, to the motion. Any more discussion? All right, hang on just a second. Yes. All right. Let's vote on it. All in favor, raise your right hand. Oh, sorry. Yes, please, caucus. 
All right, are we ready? All in favor of the motion, raise your hand. And keep them up, please. Okay, against? Uh, what else do we have? <laughs> uh, nulls, abstention. Motion carries 15 to 1. All right, well, we've got the ball in motion. Does anyone have any other discussion of next step for striped bass management? Jay. Just uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just real quick, um, a question for Nicole or Mike or Katie, one of you guys. Did, does the technical committee need any guidance at this point as to what your recruitment assumption should be, or are you just going to roll forward with what you've used to this point? You're going to have to run a projection to do this, right? So do you need guidance on that assumption or any other? Um, I, I, um, it, it, I guess it, the answer depends. We would probably move forward with what we presented as our preferred uh, recruitment scenario as part of the peer review. So unless there's interest from the board in, in an alternate scenario, and I, I guess I should mention for completeness uh, that we did uh, actually bring two recruitment scenarios, one random draws of recruitment uh, and one with the um, hockey stick recruitment uh, that, that we showed. We did the random draws of recruitment as, uh, as a sensitivity analysis, not as our preferred run. Um, so we, unless, unless the board was interested in something different, we would move forward with our, our plan A um, hockey stick recruitment relationship that we showed earlier. Andy. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just before we leave this, um, perhaps the most disturbing thing that I think a number of people around the table agreed to, agreed to was the dead discards, the recreational side. So I'm asking, expecting, hoping that the stock assessment, the final report, will include the what, when, where, and what sector those dead discards occurred in. Is that, is that expected to be in the report? Yeah, we, we would expect the, the plots that we showed, uh, that just we showed will, will be in the report, the table letter in the briefing materials, unless you're referring to something different. Um, so what, what I want to be able to know when, when we get to this question is I want to know where along the coast, in what fishery, whether it's in the ocean or in the bay, the discards occur so that we can have an understanding. Uh, Doug, Doug uh, was, was indicating we need to understand what this means to the public, and I think that would be very helpful to know which part of which sector and geographically and whether it's on the coast or in the bay, these discards are occurring. So we can kind of wrap our head around that, which is the most disturbing of all the issues, I think, that we've been presented with today. So that's what I'm requesting. Thank you. The, uh, we believe that most of that is in the report, and if it's not, we'll make sure it's included as part of the report from this motion. Anything else before we leave this agenda item? Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to um, highlight that, you know, it's pretty clear that there's going to be a management document soon uh, being developed, and we have a development team, and I would, you know, appreciate the board to look back at those members and just verify that those are the right folks for this management document. I, there could be any range of issues considered in there, so um, please look back and, and let me know if there should be any changes. Do we need to do anything to re-energize them or charge them to uh, reorganize at this point? Or they're just sitting dormant waiting for our orders? Excellent. Um, can you send out an email, perhaps, and remind us to look at our PDTs uh, members? Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a suggestion to the formation of the meeting for May. I'd leave a big chunk of time for this meeting in May. So noted. Our next agenda item is revisiting um, 
providing comments to NOAA Fisheries regarding the proposed measure to lift the ban on wreck fishing in the federal uh, Block Island Sound Transit Zone. So the question is, it was originally, I think we would kick it, the can down until the official review is out. Given what we've seen as a board, do we know enough to provide comments to know at this point? Mike. To answer that, Mr. Chairman, to answer your question directly, I think we know enough, but I think that it's a strong or more strongly worded message once it's been committed to by the board and everything, it, we're on solid ground. <clears throat> it's my understanding, and this, again, maybe we should have a two-day meeting in May. Um, it's my understanding that everything is on the table still, and even the, even the, um, the model that Gary Nelson had worked on is something that we're going to get a report on and have to debate. We, I think the board needs to select its preferred path and then based on putting some solid ground under any further actions, then I think that message is just more strongly worded from the board rather than on an updated, well, however it was worded in the agenda, an updated preliminary review of a stock assessment report. Sure. Um, I wonder if we can short circuit it by having a motion or consensus for staff to craft a strongly, if we have consensus of the board saying, and I don't know we do, saying no, we, you shouldn't open that, it, some letter to that effect, rather than spending here wordsmithing. Um, could staff do that? If uh... So I'll just remind the board that when we looked at that ANPR, they came out uh, last fall, the board decided to write a letter to NOAA Fisheries stating just that, that we're going to wait until the final results come out to provide a formal comment or recommendation regarding Black Island Sound. So the board essentially has already done that, and I think what Mike was just saying is we're still in that boat. We're waiting for those final results to come out. So I think that has already been checked off the list. Um, from my seat at least uh, well I'm not sure so we've never we just said hang on don't do anything we haven't provided a letter saying hell no or yeah sure go ahead with it right and that's what Derek maybe you could uh, advise us that's what you're looking for a letter from this board I guess in the ideal world yes uh, I think we were planning you know back in the annual meeting in October the the assessment would be final for this this board we would have heard the presentation. We can, you know, provide comment from the board back to NOAA, so we could, you know, go forward and make some decisions on directions to go. Um, I guess the hesitation and waiting till May now puts another three months into that process. Um, I'm not sure the if that timeline still fits or how how we would move forward, considering the fact that, you know, as Katie mentioned, you know the the numbers and the trends, everything in the assessment aren't necessarily going to change. Um, we'll get more detail in the assessment reports come May, but you know, the, the trends and the, and the status is there. So as a board, can we have that discussion and maybe provide and get that maybe off the table now, understanding that come May, it's going to be a long meeting. Yeah, I, I think I'd prefer to get it off the table now. Um, Richie. Uh, question and then uh, follow up, if I may. Um, this proposal would increase mortality. Is that correct? I can't answer that. I mean, the, 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 the proposal is to consider opening up recreational fishing in Block Island Sound in that transit zone. You know what? How that translates to F? I don't know. It, Generally, if someone wants to get an area more than they're at now, there's going to be more availability and larger yeah, harvest. I, I, I think we could probably assume. And, uh, any increase of mortality at this point, I would be opposed to until after we figure out where we're going. So I would oppose it at this point. They want to wait and then May when we kind of figure where we're headed. The answer might be different, but right now, if they're, if they're looking for an answer, I'd oppose it. Justin. I'm sorry, Jay. One of the Jays. 
That's okay. I've been called worse. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I'm going to, I, so it, it's interesting. I thought Mike originally was saying let's wait maybe. So I, I'm having a little trouble following, but I would be in the camp of waiting to May. It's closed now, so waiting doesn't impact that part of it. And, and the difficulty that we have is we've also been saying in, uh, in Rhode Island, um, let's wait to see the outcome of the stock assessment. So we've not had an opportunity to say, hey, the stock assessment's out, here's what it said. I, I think we have a general sense of what it's gonna say. I, I don't disagree with that. Um, but I also don't see the harm in waiting until May. I think it's probably gonna be a pretty quick agenda item. I don't see us laboring over this too much based on what we learned today, but what we've not been able to do is kind of go back out and say the stock assessment did not look good, um, you know, in our area. And so I, I'd like an opportunity to be able to do that. Okay. How about a, a hybrid to save a little time? If we can get, if we have consensus with this board, we'll charge staff to put a letter together that can bring forward for the next meeting. So it'll be a five minute discussion um, and we can put it to bed. Um, so let's discuss, is anyone for opening up that area? Emerson. Uh, yes, um, and, and the reason I'm supporting that, at least as of now, is that the information that I have is that it's likely not to increase fishing effort um, but it's it, it's what's going to happen is there's going to be the same number of boats and this is primarily charter boat fleet um, and also private boats the same number of boats fishing in that area that are fishing there now it's just that right now they're densely congregated on either the new york side of that transit line or the rhode island side of that transit lane and this will allow that fleet to just um, disperse and not be fishing right on top of each other um, and, and may not or likely will not increase fishing effort. And relative to that, I'm wondering if anyone has any information or if the TC could provide it to us. Was there a reduction in recreational fishing effort when the EEZ was closed? And it was so by how much? And that's for the whole EEZ. Uh, oh, sorry. Whoop. Where'd that come from? <laughs> to the the question about whether you know did closing the EEZ reduce fishing effort? Um, I think that is something the TC could look at for the MRIP data, recognizing it's not perfect, but we do have some information on um, total number of trips as well as directed trips and where those trips happen in the in the in the ocean. We could look at that if that was something the board was interested in. Emerson. Thank you. Um, I think it might be interesting to see that because we're looking at kind of the reverse of that now, right? So the entire EEZ was closed. So what impact did that have, have on recreational fishing effort? Um, and that might give us some indication in terms of is there going to be, an, might there be an increase in fishing effort if we open up this very tiny little sliver of the EEZ, which is probably equal to less than I don't know, one hundredth of one percent of the area that was closed. Okay. Um, we're a little bit at loggerheads then. I, I would propose we entertain a motion to write a letter opposing opening it. If it wins by majority, staff moves forward with that. We see it in May, and the states can also offer up individual opinions by letters, um, either supporting that or, or opposing it. Would anyone like to make a motion? Pat Kelleher. I move, I move we, um, 
do what you just said, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> would you like clarity? <laughs> would, would anyone like to second what I said? <laughs> All right, we have a motion by Pat Kelleher. Do we have a second? Ray. Ray Kane. Discussion? Emerson. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, I'm, I'm not going to support this motion for the reasons I just previously stated, um, as well as for the fact that um, whatever the outcome is of our future discussions based on a new stock assessment, Harvest is going to be constrained by whatever it is that we come up with. We're going to constrain recreational harvest, harvest limit by size, season, bag, a whole variety of things uh, uh, that might come out of the, the, the final discussion here. So, so that effort is going to be constrained, and it's probably going to be lowered anyhow. So I, I don't see how this is going to increase overall fishing effort on the resource. Thank you. David. Yeah. And then I Dennis. I turn this to be brief. I just a uh, question, I mean, the directive is to compose a letter. It does not say submit a letter uh, to NOAA. So is the intent to compose a letter and then circulate it to the board to bring it back in, at the May meeting? That's what it says. At the May meeting. Review at May meeting. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Missed that. Uh, I, I believe... Our intent is to compose, and we'll vote again at the May meeting. Dennis. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Conversations we had at the last board meeting and this board meeting is the whole exercise is simply to legalize an illegal fishery. It's been brought out quite clearly that there's a fishery going on there, and we want to legitimize it so therefore I don't think that's a good thing and therefore I support the motion John uh, thank you mr. chairman um, I support the motion too for obvious reasons but uh, it shouldn't be lost on the board that Congress also issued a uh, another directive to open up the entire EEZ so I'm not sure where we are on that. Maybe Derek can, can provide some, some insight there, but we may want to kill two birds here and include our opposition in the letter. Derek, would you care to weigh in on that? No. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the second item to move forward in, the, in that language was well, the first one with Block Island Sound was to move forward and consider it at that point. The second one was upon completion of the stock assessment to work with the commission to consider opening the EEZ, so the entire coastwide EEZ. Um, so that will be coming at some point. Um, I figured you know, that's something that we can pick up after we have review of the, the assessment itself in May, so we may even push that a little bit further. Whether that goes through the whole ANPR rule process or if we can consult consider it here and based on the results we don't go forward you know that, that's i think up for the discussion and consideration at that point andy then emerson thank you mr chairman so after the october meeting when we heard this news that there was two parts to this the transit zone and then the, the wider discussion of opening the eez um, i felt the need to pen a letter on behalf of the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission and the Pennsylvania delegation. And, and I did meet the deadline, and it did show up online on the federal uh, register. I guess that's what it is. And there's no reason why you can't send two letters. You can send a letter now. You sent one already. You can send another letter. You can send three letters. I, I sent a letter, and I reserved my own opportunity to send an additional letter later if I like. I'm, I'm concerned that um, 
you know, we don't necessarily have a dog in the fight on the transit zone, but we do have a dog in the fight on the EEZ as a whole. And I'm concerned about the way this is moving along kind of almost discreetly and covertly that, well, we'll address this part and then maybe we'll address the larger part later sometime. None of us could predict that the federal shutdown was going to occur not long after those comments were, were registered. So we've lost the opportunity for the stock assessment to be ready today, which also has put back our opportunity to comment by having the stock assessment in our hand. My recommendation is if the, it's the will of the board, the majority of the board, at this time is to send a letter now re-expressing your concerns about the transit zone and what else might be on deck and then reinforce that with information from the stock assessment when it becomes available where you can hone in and make it a, a more finely tuned letter. My concern is that this is kind of, by being stretched out, maybe the importance of it is, is, might be lost by a little bit. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any, uh, Emerson, you? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, with your permission, a question through you to Derek, if possible. Please. Uh, I'm just wondering where NIMS is with, with um, the issue of the transit zone, op opening up the transit zone. Um, is NIMS just waiting for a response from this commission before they move forward? Uh, um, or, or, or is NIMS at some other point in their consideration? Looking, in, <clears throat> kind of looking back in the audience, I'm not quite sure how to answer that one, Emerson. Um, mainly because of the, with the lapse of appropriation, you know, we haven't been in the office for, you know, a month and a half, basically since this, this all started. Um, you know, I personally have not had conversations to see exactly where NIMS is in the, or NOAA, you know, secretary's level is in making any, any decisions, which is kind of my push when I was talking to, to Mike before was to try and get something moving here. So when that does come to me, you know, we have a, a response from the commission. Any more discussion on the motion? Caucus needed? Okay, take, take a minute to caucus. Is everyone ready? Again, the motion is to just compose the letter. We will vote on sending it in May. New York, you good? All right, all in favor, raise your hand. Okay, opposed? Abstain? No. All right, passes. 16. 15001. So, Mike, I guess you are up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is it okay if I stay on the side of the table here? Okay, I did prepare a, a presentation, a few slides, um, so we can wait till that comes up. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so. What I'm going to present to you are some of the highlights um, for our conservation equivalency effectiveness report that the state of Maryland committed to last year upon approval of um, a conservation equivalency plan. Um, next slide. So if you all remember, you know, we had an issue in Maryland as a result of increasing the size limit from 18 to 20 inches as a result of addendum four, exactly what we were talking about before we, we were experiencing huge numbers of discards. And we wanted to address that concern through proposing to the board a, a plan which um, established a 19 inch minimum size and required that non offset circle hooks were be used with bait fishing. Uh, we also committed to providing this report uh, here at the winter meeting uh, as, and, and trying to gather relevant information <clears throat> on compliance uh, and other 
things that we were working on as part of our program uh, for 20, this, this meeting in 2019, and it's, it's hard to believe a year has passed since, since we were here discussing that. Uh, what I'm going to cover, and I'll do it very quickly, and I want to also thank Max for, for putting this on the agenda for only 10 minutes. I'll probably go about nine and then answer any questions that you have, so thank you, Max. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what our current gear regulations are. They, and I'm pointing that out because they differed just a bit from the discussion that we had at the board meeting last year. I'm going to go over some outreach and education efforts, enforcement and compliance, and then we did a little bit of an analysis. We, 2018's uh, MRIP data were preliminary at the point when we were working on this still. And so we, but I do want to go over an analysis that we, that we conducted, um, which I, I think you'll, you'll appreciate the results. So uh, next slide. <clears throat> okay, so the current gear regulations in Maryland um, apply to fishermen that are chumming or live lining. So a person engaging in this activity during the periods of May 16th through uh, December 15th um, and May 16th through December 15th of 2019 shall only use a circle hook. Um, a circle hook is defined as a non-offset hook at the point turned perpendicularly back to the shank. And you'll see the examples of what a circle hook isn't and is not um, as it applies to the regulation. Next slide. There's a little delay on my screen here. I'll go up to the big one. <clears throat> okay, so where things changed slightly, um, and we discussed this, I think, back in maybe, our, maybe at the annual meeting, we talked a little bit about this, but when we went to implement the rule, um, bait fishermen uh, kind of pushed back a little bit. Folks that were fishing for other species that were not striped bass, um, thought that implementing a circle hook across the board um, was going to impact them, not only the fishermen, but the tackle shops. And, and those of you who are in the, in the business of implementing new regulations in your state, sometimes we have to, uh, have to consider the gains uh, versus some things that you m might not be able to accomplish. Uh, we would have lost the whole program had we tried to push in, uh, requiring for all bait fishing uh, the use of circle hooks. So you'll see the rule there. I don't need to read it to you. So we are allowing for the use of J hooks for bait fishermen. Um, however, we did describe the, pro the prohibition on treble hooks through this process. So treble hooks are no longer allowed uh, in Maryland. Next slide. Okay, moving on to education and outreach. Um, we conducted we, you know, we phased in a series of education and outreach programs consisting of emails to hundreds of thousands of uh, email addresses. We had staff doing industry seminars. We were all over Facebook and Twitter. Uh, radio interviews were conducted throughout the year, and we produced you know, an, a, a large amount of just handout material that we were giving to folks uh, that, were conduct that were working through the APIS program, uh, as well as the tackle shops. Uh, and other places of interest, uh, state parks and, and places where people were, were going to be engaging uh, in fishing to get kind of get the word out that the rule was going to change for next year. Next slide. Okay, so moving on to enforcement and compliance. Uh, our Natural Resources Police Office in Maryland conducted saturation patrols over the summer. Uh, those saturation patrols were mostly focused on the charter boat uh, fishing activity, uh, and the report from NRP was that circle, it was nearly 100 percent compliance with the use of circle hooks during those patrols. Um, field officers also reported at the end of the season that they had no real issues throughout the year. They didn't, it wasn't quantified in any way, but um, reports through their uh, superiors indicated that they did not have a problem with compliance with, for the use of circle hooks when chumming and live lining uh, in 2018. Through the ACCSP program and our APIS program, um, we also were able to acquire s some information throughout the year. Uh, we had 872 ang anglers provided answers to extra questions that we asked as a part of that program. Uh, we worked with um, we work with the folks at MRIP 
uh, and through ACCSP to develop a technique so that extra questions that you ask were asked, they were not added to the federal form, and we, we made sure staff weren't slowing down the acquiring uh, angler interviews. So when things were a little slow and people had a little extra time at the end of the interview, uh, we had staff asking additional questions about the use of circle hooks in their fishing activity. Uh, 400 of those 872 anglers were not chumming or live lining or using bait, so they were using some form of an artificial lure. Um, those individuals from the remaining anglers that were chumming, we had a 94% compliance rate based on their answers. Live liners had a 97 compliance rate based on the answers that they gave during this interview. Uh, others that were using baiting, that were used baited hooks, 30% uh, were using circle hooks, but they were not chumming and live lining, so you know, we weren't able to, you know, that because of that um, J hook requirement, we were just assuming that the rest of those, um, the rest of those anglers were using J hooks. Uh, and the numbers and more detail about those interviews, uh, you can certainly find in your report. Next slide. Okay, here's the last, the last thing I want to go over with you. And this was, um, this is, so what we did was we did an updated, so our original proposal had an analysis. And that analysis indicated that there was going to be, um, there were going to be no additional removals as part of the program. Um, we were going to be converting dead discards into harvest, and overall the total removals was, was going to be around zero with a range, uh, which was all part of the calculation. And in order to do that, we had to, take, we had to make some assumptions based on the use of artificial lures and bait throughout the waves from waves three through six. So on the left-hand side of that table, you'll see what our guess was. Uh, we guessed that in wave three, 42% of individuals would be using artificials and 58% of individuals or anglers would be using bait. Based on the information we were, to obtain, we were able to obtain from the APIS program, the actual values are on the updated side. So in wave three, we guessed 42, we, we determined 41. We guessed 58, and we determined 59. So you can see that table as you go down. There's a, there's, that was the, the, the one that was right on, on point, but we were close. However, we wanted to go back to the original um, analysis and rerun the analysis with the updated values. Uh, we also had to update the proportion of bait anglers using circle hooks. Our original proposal assumed 100 percent because we had started the program and started the rulemaking process expecting not to allow for J hooks at all with the use of bait. Now, because we did not go forward like that, we had to make we had to change our proportion uh, to reflect that that change in our rules. So. Those are the new values that went into the analysis, and I think the next slide is the last one, which shows the results. Um, so what you'll see is that under the original proposal, the proportional change in dead discards was expected to be reduced by 28% with a range of 30, minus 31 to, mi to, to minus 24. Um, the updated analysis with all the new values indicated that we did not, we didn't get there. We didn't get as far as we wanted to as far as um, the proportional change in dead, dead discards. The new analysis would indicate that, that we say that we reduced the dead dis discards by 12% with a range of uh, reduction of 14 to 10. And as you read across the table, we get to total removals. This was, um, cr this was, uh, you know, a, a a large portion of our of our analysis, and you know, we came to the board and said, you know, there's a range of total removals being minus eight percent, or it could be anywhere from minus eight to seven percent increase in total removals as part of our original analysis, with a, with an average of zero. Uh, what the updated an analysis would indicate is that we now have a new range anywhere from minus one to 13 percent increase in total removals, with the average being six. So um, we, you know, looking at that, I think since that six percent increase in our updated analysis falls within the range that was presented in the in the um, in the original analysis, you know, I would say that we 
we got as close as we could um, with our program. Now, uh, let's see. So with that said, um, you know, Merit, we felt that the program was successful. We have rules in place to continue with this program for 2019. It'll start on May 15th and carry on through December 15th. That regulation has a sunset provision, which would require us to go back and resubmit new rules for the future. Um, and our expectation right now is is to to continue on in 2019 as as we as we as I'm discussing here with you. And I, unless I can think of something else that comes up through maybe a question, uh, that's all I have. And I, maybe one more slide. Yeah, that's it. So I'll take any questions, Mr. Chairman. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, so per the motion, this was an informational presentation. It doesn't have an action associated with it. As always, if the discussion leads to an actionable thing, um, whatever. Um, so discussion or questions, Richie? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, questions for Max. Uh, <clears throat> Could you uh, read uh, the language that the technical committee reviewed and what the board passed for the conservation equivalency and how that compares to what was implemented? Read the language from the motion that the board passed for the conservation equivalency measures? The uh, proposal that the technical committee reviewed and then the motion that was passed you have to give me a second to look that up thanks thank you Jess that is the motion that was approved by the board at the February 2018 meeting, if I'm correct. I see you're reading it. Do you want me to read it? <laughs> so follow up. So, so the technical committee um, did not review um, including J hooks for bait fishing. Is that, would that be correct? Correct. So we don't know whether um, the technical committee, I believe, told us they couldn't say whether this uh, met the conservation equivalency or did not. I believe that was the report, if I'm not wrong. And if that's correct, then adding J hooks to bait fishing uh, could that have changed the technical committee's response? So I'll try to remind the board of the debate that took place in February, and that was, yeah, let me back up and say that I believe the recommendation from the te technical committee is they did not endorse any of the measures that were proposed in that conservation equivalency proposal. Um, primarily because they couldn't figure out that baseline for conservation equivalency due to the measures that are listed in Addendum 4, um, specifically that there is no base measure in Addendum 4 for the Chesapeake Bay fisheries. It is uh, simply to achieve a particular reduction from 2013 levels, or, or I'd have to look back, but it's... So the point is that there's, there was no default measure to uh, compare these changes to. Uh, it was more of a reduction to the, that had to be implemented uh, through Addendum 4. There's a lot there, but did, does that clear, clarify? Uh, Chris, then Lauren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks for the, uh, the report, Mike. Um, Mike, in your presentation, uh, it showed that 30% of the anglers using natural bait were using circle hooks. Uh, were, were you able to 
figure out from those surveys what those anglers were targeting since it was you know the apis uh, uh, surveyors i didn't i didn't see it in the report right away i didn't know if that that information was available <clears throat> Because we, no, the answer is no. Um, and some of the reasoning behind that had to do with the actual federal survey itself and, and the responses that we got. Some people were out just fishing. We, and so staff told me that they could, they could only provide this level of detail. And so that 30% that's in the report, um, so of 390 anglers, 119 reported using circle hooks. The others were expected to be using baited hooks, but there's really no way to break that down into any any other level. <clears throat> Lawrence. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mike, for a very interesting report. I really appreciate it. Uh, you had mentioned that the Maryland DNR police uh, had restrict had uh, uh, analyzed only those uh, charter boats and not private recreational boats uh, for the data. Is that correct? There were. That's close to correct. There were during these patrols where they left both sides of the bay and kind of hit the fleet all at once to, so people couldn't leave. Um, most of the boats fishing those days were charter boats. However, there were recreational anglers, recreational boats um, also inspected, but it was much fewer than the charter boat fleet. Yet, uh, just to follow up, uh, certainly when you approach 100% compliance, that's very gratifying. Uh, I would love to see what the data would show if your officers had a chance perhaps this summer to uh, analyze more thoroughly private boats uh, that would be very interesting data. Uh, I would presume that uh, uh, a, a lawbreaker would be disinclined to submit uh, feedback in a questionnaire. Uh, only those who are complying with the law would do that, I believe. So it, if, uh, additional data would be very helpful, and I do thank you. Yeah, as I mentioned, <clears throat> the plan is to continue with this in 2019 and expand upon it. Um, one of the things we'd like to expand upon is the distribution of, of, of circle hooks throughout the, throughout the interactions that we have during our outreach and education campaign, uh, as well as continuing to work with NRP to get feedback from them from the field. So that, that's all part of what we expect uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, information we'll expect next, this year. <clears throat> Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I feel like there was an agreement to do one thing and something else was was done here. Um, and they did not meet the intent and did not meet the intent of what the original proposal was, which is troubling to me. Um, I'm not sure where to go from here, but, um, you know, my, if, if they're only really affecting about 50% of where they were supposed to be going, they haven't. They ha they're not in compliance with what we agreed to. I mean, I, I don't want to pick on Maryland because I thought this was a good thing that they were doing, and I and I still applaud that they're moving in the direction of using circle hooks. But it seems to me we need to get all. If we're going to do it, you've got to go all the way. Mike. Thank you, and I appreciate the concern. We, we, I, those of us at the department also talked about this a lot as we went forward, and I, I know that I've, I've mentioned this to the board before. Um, the Chumming and Live Lining Fleet was the focus of our attention. That's, that was where we wanted, that's where we wanted the action to happen. Um, we can't, we can't specify to the species level if you're fishing for striped bass, when you're, it's, we, can't, we don't have the authority to do that. So we tried to craft it in the best way we could, knowing that we would get an enormous number of anglers who participate through the, through the portion of the year to catch striped bass in, in Maryland's Chesapeake Bay. You're likely going to be chumming and live lining, bait fishing. 
there's a lot of other things that people are bait fishing for, um, and they're just they're not it they're not overlapped. They're not, it's not an over. We we felt like we really accomplished what it was we were what our attempt was, which was to get on the chumming and the live lining fleet and, ha and make them or, you know the requirement for circle hooks. If we were to try to do, and I understand the concern, we said one thing and we modified that as we, as we promulgated regulations. We were going to lose the entire package. It wasn't going to happen in time. We weren't going to get it in place for the time period when we needed it. And we felt that the conservation effort that we would accomplish by modifying it so that the rule would go into place by May was the trade-off that we were willing to, we, that was the trade-off that we felt was needed. Um, and we still feel that we were su successful uh, in that attempt. Adam? I think we need, as a board, to think about what it was we were asking Maryland to achieve. And that was a conservationally equivalent proposal. I understand the concern that there's a line here that says required when fishing with bait, and Maryland had to deviate slightly. But at some point in time, we've got to step back and think about the gains of what we achieved. The mass educational outreach of discards and the harm of them. The extreme level of compliance that we were able to achieve in Maryland and fishermen. Greater than 90% compliance with those. And despite all that, at the end of the day, using recreational data and analysis, which we know are fraught with all kinds of concerns, the proposal still landed in the bounds of a 0% increase. I think the state should be applauded. I think it's fine to sit here and think about, okay, what can we recommend to Maryland to continue to approve it? But I hope we don't lose sight of the bigger picture with this issue and in similar issues the states may bring forward. Further discussion, actions, motions. Eric. Yeah, I guess everybody in Maryland should go buy lottery tickets because they got lucky on this one. I, that, that's, that's the way it worked out. I, I mean, Pat, I, I appreciate your comments. I'm right with you. I appreciate Adam's comments. We accomplished the task more or less. But you know, the reality of it is, if the numbers were different, or perhaps maybe the survey was con conducted differently, we may be looking at a different set of results, in which case the conversation would be totally different. So I don't know. If you, if you improve your, your tackle shop sales for circle hooks, and it's more convenient for you to do more surveys with full questions, and you get more private anglers to actually fill out a survey they're required to do, then you find out a little bit more about it. We might be having a different conversation at the end of, or maybe this time next year, but it, it's, you got lucky, that's it. So it's good for the resource, but not necessarily good for the long term. Further conversation. Mike, would it be your intent to present again next year with the 2019 data? I don't see anything in that motion that would ask me to do that. <laughs> so I'm just I'm I'm making light of it. No, um, well, I'll come back to you. Oh, I don't I don't plan to. I th we're going to have to review this anyway, and I think that we're on board with what's what we talked about for th two and a half hours earlier today. There, I think that we're going to all find ourselves having to do something for this for the future, especially in the recreational fishery. So, you know. Changing our program right now would would not be a good thing mid-season. It wouldn't be effective until August, probably. Um, size limits would change. It, it's our intent is to go forward, work with this board on future management issues that arise through this benchmark uh, assessment and analysis. All right, enough. All right, next item is to review changes to. Virginia's striped bass monitoring program. Nicole? Uh, there we go. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Today I'll be presenting a technical committee report on changes to Virginia's striped bass monitoring and tagging programs. I'll start off by giving some background information, review the rationale for the program changes, and then present what those changes were and the comments provided by the technical committee. The Virginia programs began in 1992, and they have been primarily conducted on the Rappahannock River using commercial pound nets. They have been supplemented with fike net and or gill net samples from the James and York Rivers during certain periods, but the only long-term consistent sampling is from the Rappahannock pound nets. There were a few things that led to Virginia implementing these changes in 2018. Uh, one was that the Virginia pound net data was previously used as an abundance, abundance index in the assessment, and it was dropped from the benchmark stock assessment in 2018 due to some concerns about the survey. Recent staffing changes in Virginia, as well as funding reductions in Virginia, were the other reasons for these changes in 2018. The changes implemented were pound net sampling was completely replaced with multi-panel anchor gill net sampling, tagging was conducted through electrofishing, and sampling and tagging in both the James and Rappahannock rivers was done, and both programs were deemed successful in 2018 in terms of establishing protocols and the number of specimens sampled and, tar and tagged. As Amendment 6 requires all spawning stock survey changes to be reviewed and approved by the Technical Committee, the TC reviewed the changes via a conference call on January 10th, and they unanimously approved all of the program changes. The TC did have a few comments on the proposed changes, specifically that reducing the soak time may reduce unnecessarily high sample sizes and gear saturation that the program only samples the Rappahannock and James Rivers, not the York, so it is missing information on one of the spawning grounds, and this was because the FMP only specifies that the Rappahannock and James Rivers are to be sampled. The monitoring program requirements listed in the fishery management plan may not support the future data and assessment needs, and so the technical committee is recommending that the board consider changes to the FMP to update and improve those requirements in consultation with the technical committee. And I'll take any questions. Questions for Nicole. I have one, the last item. Um, will we be getting a report or a a letter um, regarding things you'd like to see updated for monitoring? I think what the technical committee was expecting was just a charge from the board to revisit those program requirements and then we're hoping that once the peer review report comes out some of the elements that are needed for future assessment and future development, specifically of the two-stock model, will be in that report, and we can inform the board as to some changes for the program requirements. And those requirements, would that have to be an amendment or an addendum? Addendum. addendum. Okay. So we should keep that in mind as we move forward that this may be an item that we need to include. Rob, while you got your hand up, so um, the Commonwealth has the resources to continue with the new monitoring? Yes, and uh, I'd like to make just a couple of comments in that um, if you go back in time, maybe the 1940s, 1950s, the Rappahannock was sort of the area with the most abundance for striped bass. Um, and I think for that reason, when VIMS, which has been doing this work really since 1990, and I followed every year, um, eventually there were spatial problems with the tagging. Um, there were not pound nets in the James River. The York River pound nets disappeared probably in the early 2000s. But it was the reliance on the pound nets which was the downfall. And uh, I think what 
is offered now is a really good program um, and you know it's it's taking advantage of different techniques not new techniques the electrofishing is used elsewhere um, the variable mesh gill net which Maryland has had a successful spawning stock survey for years is something to look forward to and I think that Nicole putting up the idea of 2018 dropping the pound net index that really started in 2005 um, so you know there have been it's been some trials and errors and um, I think now looking forward for the future uh, we can keep supporting it we have supported it um, we do support it through wallop bro funding that was what was indicated by Nicole with the uh, the comment about funding issues um, but the way that VIMS is situated they also have chess map and so there's the same investigators working on striped bass and they have more of a compartmentalized approach rather than having different sectors of VIMS doing different things so uh, I'm really really pleased at what has happened um, and I think the board will too as we go in the future because there have been very few occasions where either the spawning stock information was able to be used and the tagging information after a certain amount of years uh, it also suffered from spatial constraints of getting the tagging so uh, thank you for the time and uh, I think this will be good Thank you. Any questions for Rob or Nicole? Rob, would you like to make a motion? I would. Um, I would move that the board consider the changes that have been made to Virginia's um, two monitoring programs be approved, um, both for the spawning stock survey and for the tagging program. If you want to shorten that, that's okay. Is there a second? John Clark, second. Discussion. All right, we'll wait till it's up on the board. I need to read it for us. I haven't read one yet today. <laughs> The motion is move to approve changes to Virginia's striped bass monitoring program. Uh, seconded by John Clark. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, is this approved by consensus? Anyone opposed? So approved. Uh, next up, update on the tagging program, Tony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have conducted 10 out of the 13 uh, tagging trips through the cooperative striped bass hook and line tagging trips. And unfortunately, this year we have not been as successful as we have been in years past. And I believe we have tagged 50 fish in total. Um, in some cases, they, the Captain Ryan is doing an excellent job, um, and they're finding fish, but the fish just don't seem to be biting. Um, there have been, I think, a couple of days where when the weather shifted, they weren't able to locate the fish as well. Um, we have three more trips left, so we're hoping that we will, you know, have some bang up days on those days and get a bunch of fish tagged. And I just wanted to thank um, North Carolina. Um, Greg Rieger stepped in and did a lot of the tagging <clears throat> and led the trips when the federal government shut down. Um, he has been a wonderful help since Josh Newhart hadn't been working since he is a employee of the Fish and Wildlife Service. So thank you to North Carolina for giving us Greg. Bob. I've got one other introduction that I should have done at the very outset of the beginning, and I apologize for not doing that. If you notice in the Pennsylvania delegation, there's a, a new face in between Lauren and Andy, and that's uh, Tim Schaefer. Tim was recently appointed as the executive director of the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. 
Uh, so, uh, so he's technically our administrative commissioner, and, and Andy is his proxy at the commission. But uh, Tim came by just to uh, observe the, the the meeting for a couple of days, and uh, you know, feel free to reach out and say hello to Tim in the, in your downtime between meetings. So, welcome, Tim. We're glad you're here. Welcome, Tim. Any questions for Tony regarding the tagging program? Seeing none, any business before this board? Uh, yes, Ray. Yeah, it's a question to the technical committee, the assessment committee. We, we, we've seen a lot of graphs and charts, and probably I'm going to be told there's no way it can be done. But this commission went through a painstaking uh, a while back about a tagging program, which was implemented coastwise. How uh, does anybody remember the numbers of fish that were poached that drove this commission to a tagging program, you know, at point of sale? And how would that reflect in these retrospective graphs that you put up, you know, in layman's terms? Is there any way of looking at the number of poached fish? and where the biomass would be today if you didn't have, what, what were the numbers, two or three million pounds of fish in that sting operation? This goes back a few years ago, but just a question. I'll, I'll try. I, I, I'm not familiar with, with those numbers, uh, but your point about the retrospective is a good one. Um, uh, the sort of classical ideas about what's driving retrospective is uh, either missing catch, uh, change in natural mortality or, or change in catchability over time. Uh, if we were missing catch, um, my understanding uh, from work at the Northeast Science Center is that um, we'd actually see the opposite retrospective pattern. We would see um, increases in SSB over time, and we, we see the opposite. So it's, it's, it's hard to say, um, uh, but um, I, I don't have a great answer for you, I'm sorry to say. Thank you. Other business? Seeing none, we are adjourned.